Hello, hello, everybody. Sorry, I was making skipping an ad on my iPad, and I missed the transition to being live. So um, an oddity of the program that I use for these streams is that uh, I don't see all the messages that were in the chat before the stream starts. So the first one I see is Peaceful Warrior 1959 about clean loop channel stuff, and we'll get to that. But if anyone has asked a question or made a comment before that, please copy and paste it so I will see it. And we will get to some questions in a minute. Um, something I just wanted to mention, first of all, in the last live stream uh, with technical difficulties with Brad, I had, a client had dropped off this exotic XTC, and I said, you know, it's amazing that for the low, low price of only three to $4,000, this one with the Paulina is 4, 4K, you can get a guitar that's every bit as good as most examples of 50s and 60s fenders that, you know, cost more than your house. Um, but, you know, $4,000 is still a lot for an awful lot of people. $3,000, $4,000, you know, that's a pro level. I've got one guitar that costs that much, the 335 The rest are about two k And then I've got the uh, uh, Squire bass I've got about $600 into. So I, I I don't want you to think that I'm like some gear snob. You know, I'm surrounded by vintage amps. That's, you know, hazard of the gig. But um, it's not that you have to have a $4,000 guitar. Though, you know, it's nice that you can go out and buy something that in so many ways is as good as most vintage ones. But another client dropped off his Yamaha Revstar. And this is an $800 guitar. And I'll do a full review of this soon. It is a phenomenal guitar in many aspects by most metrics. Uh, the, the stainless steel frets are really well done. It's not perfectly level, but it's closer than most uh, guitars that have not been, you know, there are people who do fret jobs that don't do as well as this. You know, this is really damn good. You'd have to go to the glazer level, et cetera, to get uh, better. Um, the, the nibs feel great the polishing is really good again I've, I've seen better but for a production indonesian guitar for 800 bucks that's insane it's a very stable neck it's got carbon reinforcement uh, a sneak preview of the review that i'll be doing is that this guitar has 10 possible sounds two of which are good one of which is okay but um, that'll be addressed when I make some changes to this guy's guitar. But here it is through that restored Rust Bucket 67 basement. <laughs> and then those are the three good sounds, and the rest are stuff which I don't find particularly useful. And I just realized that I'm playing guitar in front of John Nathan Cordy. So uh, I'm going to go kill myself now. Hey, John, thanks for joining us today. Thank you to all of you for joining today. Um, but, you know, I think it's amazing that for $800, you can go and buy a guitar. And if that one doesn't float your boat, some of the PRSSEs, like the David Grissom one, uh, some of the sires today even, are, you know, six to $900 range, you know, six to 1000 and they're staggeringly good instruments. And while that's still quite a bit of money to most people, if you ingest for inflation, that's $250, $300, pretty much what I paid for a, a Squire Korean Strat in 1987, uh, which was not, by any metric, a good guitar. So, um, you know, it, we live in a golden age for amazing sounds through pedals and modeling and various amps, amazing guitars really across the board from a lot of different manufacturers. I just wish that the amplifiers were also amazing at those low prices. And that's one of the reasons I do what I do. I, I do like pointing out when there are some gems out there in the, in the uh, lower price range. You know, when the demand on these, the demand on the David Grissoms goes down and Say you could get one of those for six hundred dollars and an AC fifteen custom for five hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollars. That's a hell of a rig um, compared to that Korean Squire Strat and the uh, Gorilla that I started out with. So I hope everyone's enjoying themselves this beautiful Saturday. I hope you are having a beautiful Saturday. Some of you are gonna be Sunday, some of you are gonna be Saturday night. And if you're spending your Saturday night with you, I am sorry. Let's get to some questions. 
so peaceful warrior i have not thought oh yeah okay now i understand i thought you were talking about a clean effects loop yeah i'm um getting here i'm getting some loops in and i hope to get some from mr cordy there as well i've spoken to some other players uh, both clients friends and YouTube personalities that you might know, many of whom are fantastic musicians. But I'm also going to be doing a video soon where I give you the technical requirements to submit loops to me. I'm going to first have to create an email address for that, so all that stuff goes into just one email address. But uh, I can give you uh, the nuts and bolts right now. Mono is preferred, uh, 44.1K or higher, 24-bit preferably, 16-bit will work. Wave or AIFF is preferred. MP3, if it's real high resolution, is acceptable but not great. Uh, I can always downsample. If you do 96K 32-bit, uh, I can bring that down to the format uh, I stream at. And I, I would not want any anything other than just the direct capture. So either, whether it's through a computer interface or a modeler that has a direct out or just a DI box, uh, you know, whatever level you need to record it digitally, I'll adjust the peaks to be where it would be from a pickup in playback. No pedals, no added anything. I want it to be like, okay, this is the signal coming out of your guitar, and now it's going to be going into this amp or that amp or this other amp over here. And maybe later in the stream, I'll play a, a loop live for you through that basement. Let me know if you heard that guitar okay before I do that. So I will be making that happen soon, and I'm looking forward to it. Let's see here. Ted C's got a question. Uh, I don't like the term black facing because it uh, can hurt people's feelings for no good reason. I understand it's not intended uh, in, in that sense, but I think it's such a fraught issue and it's so easy not to uh, uh, hurt people. I mean, it's not like, oh, he hurt his feelings. I mean, that's a serious issue for a lot of people. And uh, so black panel is my preferred term. But I understand, and I don't think you meant anything by it, Ted. I don't think anyone reasonably would. It's just one of those things I don't like to toss out casually, though sometimes it slips out just out of old habit. Um, 71 versus 79, basement 10, basement 35. Black paneling, black facing, AB-763 uh, uh, AB is what's usually meant. It's a much misunderstood concept. A lot of amps uh, come in 70s that have been black faced, uh, they've not made anything better. They've changed certain things to be the AB763, but not all things. Uh, whoever did it was just copying and pasting, connecting the dots, did not understand the circuitry. A lot of the times the problem is in the lead dress. The problem is in um, added grid uh, uh, leak, uh, uh, snubber caps and stuff. To And snubber caps all through the late 70s stuff just because the wiring was such spaghetti. You can make a... Uh, 70s uh, phase inverter with the 330Ks and the 47Ks uh, and the uh, dual 68Ks going to the uh, bias balance pot behave beautifully. The things you need to do, I uh, need to remove the fixed resistor to ground from the bias balance pot and replace that with a 10K uh, trim pot in series with like a 6 to 12, 12 6 to 15K resistor depending on uh, the range you need. That gives you an additional bias level as well as the bias balance. That's fantastic. And the other thing is uh, Fender decreased the grid stopper, uh, sorry, the grid leaks by a third. So they went from one megs to 330Ks. So they went down by a factor of three. They increased the input coupling cap from 0.1, sorry, uh, from one nanofarad, 0 0.001, to 10 nanofarad, 0 0.0010, sorry, 0 0.01. No one told me there was going to be math involved. Um, so they decrease the resistors by a factor of three, but they increase the uh, cap by a factor of 10. gives it way too much low end. If you take a bone stock 70s and you clean up all the wiring and you add the bias level control and then you replace that 10 nanofarad cap with a 3.3 nanofarad cap, that way the cap and the resistors have scaled together. You're going to have much the same low end response as the black face circuit and that one little change um, I guess two little changes if you do the bias as well and getting all the DC off the board in the process makes that a fantastic sounding amp uh, that's the problem they use also some 70s amps have the wrong tapers for the uh, bass and treble pots 
Uh, so sometimes the knob position, the o'clocks have to change. Uh, the ballpark cost differences, well, to do it as a blanket thing where you're just changing the entire circuit, that can be very expensive, and usually it's wasted money. Uh, the actual changes to make it uh, behave properly as far as the changes in the phase inverter circuit are just the bias level and changing one capacitor. The real problem is that most of those amps are from the 70s with a heavily waxed board. The wax becomes conductive. The entire thing is a hissy, bu a buzzy mess. And removing all that wax properly, that's where the labor comes in. So that could be a two to $400 job, depending on how much else needs to be done in the amp. Hey, Aaron, I have not opened one up. I have not heard one in person. I look forward to eventually getting to make their acquaintance. But until then, I have no opinion, good or bad. Hey, Chris, let's see. I'm making my way through your question, just a second. All right, uh, I know vintage fenders like the back of my hand, I know AC30s, I know box uh, Marshalls. The reissues, I know the circuit, but I don't know the resistor names R12 or C5. So if you could explain to me what you're actually asking about there, because I, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, you're changing a 68 Vibrolux, the custom Vibrolux reissue to the 65? Um, okay, now I get it. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you have to... Sorry. I had to visualize the thing in my head because I'm not thinking of a C5 and R12. I'm thinking of just the circuit. Yeah, you have to remove the two blue jumpers, the one across the plates on uh, uh, V1 and V2B, and you need to add C5. You can add a uh, 47 nano, which is the original. You can add a 22 if you want. It gives it a little tighter lows. And yes, you need to add R12, which is the mix resistor for that channel. And um, if you really want that amp to be good, you also need to remove that 18K resistor from the mid spot, uh, sorry, from the base pot on the normal channel to ground and put a uh, jumper wire there. Um, uh, be careful because it's really easy to lift those pads there. They just cut the trace and put a resistor there. You've got to reconnect the trace, um, um, but with a jumper wire, make it match what's actually happening in the standard channel. Um, and then the um, negative feedback resistor needs to go from 1.5K to 820 ohms. And the um, there's a reverb, uh, there's a, a resistor in the reverb's return circuit that in the 68 is a one meg and needs to be a 470K in the um, 65. So see, I do know this stuff. I, I was just confused by a bunch of part numbers. As, I, as I've said before, I'm terrible at remembering sequences of letters and numbers that don't have any meaning. Um, it's, uh, I'm not perfect. But yeah, okay, there's the answer to your question. Sorry it took me a while to get to it. Uh, let's see. A jo jolly Bobby goer. Is that right? Bobby Ogre. Jolly Bobby Ogre. It's fun to say. I can't say that five times, I don't think, at any speed. Uh, general tips on how to get started on it with transformer hum. I don't know that that is something that we have time to get into today because solid state design is fairly complicated. Uh, if I had your amp on the bench, it might be something simple. But with any amp that's that old, you're going to have desiccated filter caps. And filter caps in solid state amps are used as coupling caps between stages, which are there to block DC. When they begin to leak, all the DC they're supposed to block comes through. And you, unless you have a scope and are already at a level more advanced, you would not have to ask these questions. That's not a quick thing to find out. And you might find yourself having to replace every capacitor and multiple transistors in, the, in that app. And a lot of those transistors haven't been made for 30 years, and you have to buy them off eBay. If you need two, you have to buy 10 and hope that none of them are, for, are, are, are forgeries and that any of them work. It can be more money than the app is worth. But if you're really interested in it, 
I suggest getting books on this because the real answer is book length, so I can't go into it here. I'm sorry. Hey, Joe. Uh, GZ34 and a 5F1 circuit. As far as putting it in with an F 5F1 circuit, sure, but in terms of an actual 5F1 with that power transformer, uh, transformer is probably not going to be happy with the GZ34 current draw. And uh, the B plus in that amp is already going to be with that transformer is going to be low enough that you um, you probably be better off with the the five uh, Y three. Um, I will talk about fifties wiring in uh, a separate video. I'm planning on doing on that on how the whole thing works. And there are, there's no such thing as indispensable paper oil caps. That's that's internet garbage. Uh, caps is caps, man. Uh, there's no voltage there. It's a passive high pass filter uh, the value matters uh, whether it's microphonic matters but beyond that any good ceramic any good film they're all going to sound the same uh, the paper and oil stuff is just something started on the internet to separate people from their money remember that no one ever got w <clears throat> pardon me I messed up my own joke but it's a serious joke no one ever got rich by selling metronomes see here. Hey, Wes. Uh, Wes, I want to see something here. Let's see. I can't do it on this screen, but let me find you here. Well, dang it, Wes, I was going to make you a mod. Um, I'm not single anyone else out as not being a mod, but I've gotten to know Wes a little bit, and I, I think he's a very sensible fellow. And um, uh, I need a mods for when Brad sleeps in just to kick out bots and stuff, nothing uh, onerous. I'll probably add some more of you guys who are regulars to the mod list, but I cannot seemingly do it on my iPad, and I certainly can't do it on here, so I'll figure it out later. Um, so if anyone sees a sex bot ad on here or any, in, anything inappropriate or uh, anyone saying that they've won anything. Just just ignore it. Let's see. Thanks, Wes. The Basement Project was fun. Thanks, everyone. Uh, hey, Broken Home. I'm sorry to hear about that, man. That's tough. My opinion on Victory Amps. I, I gave it in the Amps Under $1,000 video. I think they're pretty good. They sound good. Um, I think... For the money, they're a bit overpriced. Um, I don't like any of those lunchbox style heads because when you want to change a tube on a gig, it's very difficult to get everything to take uh, line up and go back. And the screws like to get stripped, and it's easy to lose them on a stage. And uh, a lot of I don't know that's the case with the wizard uh, cages, but a lot of amp companies that have done that, the cages get rusty. And when, they, when the thing needs service, because it's a very jam-packed, everything's so compact in there, uh, the service is going to be very expensive down the road. But that's down the road. If they sound good to you, um, there's, not, there's no flaw that's going to rear its ugly within 10 years, I don't think, other than tubes. Um, you know, I think they're good sounding amps. I think they're trying to do an awful lot of things at once. And I don't care about the Lee Anderton thing. Um, that's... Not my circus, not my monkeys. Well, I meant to get back with, with John uh, last weekend on that subject, Chris, uh, about getting some of his loops. And he's, he's, he's made the offer, um, and I'm going to take him up on it. But I have been, you know, if you saw the basement video, that was not a one-day thing. I have been incredibly busy, and I think John understands that. So I will be, um, will be, getting with him. So he's going to be one of many great players, I think, that will be letting you hear amps in their finest, as opposed to my feeble fumblings. But my feeble fumblings are free. Hey, Scott, as Mr. Wilcox's 67 bass pin right here, I'll be going through that later tonight. And that's Mr. Wilcox's uh, Yamaha Revstar that I was semi-gushing over earlier. And more to come on that guitar in days in, uh, soon. 
Hey, Divided by Time uh, Studios. Yeah, that pink telly is is gorgeous. Um, I don't happen to have an extra 4K right now, which is probably for the best because I just look at the damn thing and never play it because it's just so pretty. Uh, Michael uh, Liebarger, no, I don't have any experience with uh, the the, uh, the simplifier pedals. Sorry. Wes, they are not noiseless P90s. In fact, they are very noisy uh, P90s in this room with transformers and, and things all around me. Uh, if that were my guitar, I would be putting either uh, Lawler or Mojo Tone uh, quiet, uh, noiseless P90s in it just because I'm doing this stuff um, in this room with all these transformers and they have hum fields. I'll let you, I'll let you hear one. Uh, hopefully you'll hear this. Maybe you won't, but... Middle pickup, though. Much better. So all my guitars are either humbucker or noiseless of some variety, though most of my noiseless uh, guitars are, in fact, stacked humbuckers of various stripes. Um, I guess I should explain this. You know, you should have seen the other guy. Uh, the other guy in this case was probably a, a gal, and she was about that big, a little spider. I walked into a web about a week ago. Didn't realize I'd gotten bit or anything, um, but I had... I had a little Shelob's lair moment. I hate the feel of spider webs. I, I didn't scream like a little girl, but I was like, ah, oh, yuck. Um, and then about two days later, I had a little red dot, and then that little bit of flesh there, all that skin, it's just trying to die on me. Uh, not falling out like a big rec, rec, uh, brown recluse chunk, you know, anything. Uh, I will survive, and I think the spider survived too, which is good because spiders do good things, and it was my stupid fault for walking through her house. Uh, yeah, the Japanese looks nice, uh, John. Um, I'm not sure that, I, I saw your video and I agree with you. I don't know that you can really justify the, the Japanese price difference. Um, I, th I, I agree that they should use some better woods, offer some different finishes. Uh, I, th I, I don't, I would not go for the Japanese. I would get the, the Indonesian and just change out the, uh, the electronics as I will be doing with Mr. Wilcox's in days to come. Yeah, uh, Chris, watching John play and watching uh, Chris Buck play and quite a few others, it's depressing. You know, how do you think I feel? You've seen the guys who come over here who play, you know, Brian Lindsay the other day and Joe Restivo and, and, and um, Logan and Steve. And they're playing amps that I've been working on that I've been playing for days, uh, through, usually with my guitar. My guitars like them better than they like they like me. Uh, I can't really blame them. They're very nice people. Thanks, Magisterium. Appreciate that. That basement was a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. Yeah, I, I want to get a, a DGTSC in. Um, I, I've met Paul, uh, Paul Reed, and we we hung out for a couple hours in an after, on an afternoon once uh, and a very nice guy, very smart guy, very, you know, anyone who pulls off what he's done to become the third big maker in a market that was always just primarily Fender Gibson, you know, he, he's really pulled off quite the, uh, the achievement and I respect the hell out of him. But I have never bonded with any of his guitars. Uh, every... I guess they're calling them cores now, I've played, has been a very nice guitar that's someone else's guitar, just never spoke to me. Uh, I had an SE, one of the earlier single cuts, and uh, I did not care for the, the way that the neck, uh, which was mahogany, was kind of spongy, but spongier than my SG's neck. So if you play a low, low E or low A and then do a bend, that the, the thing would drop like it was a strat with a floating trim. Whereas my SG and specifically the 335 or Les Paul, that those low E's stay stable. So I've not played um, the the DGT SC, but I'm curious to because it looks like it might be a really nice thing. It sounds good when you play it at least, and when when uh, Mr. Grissom plays it as well. The classes of caps. Can we talk about the classes of caps and which choice is best for a trem circuit? 
do you mean the LFO, the three in a line for, for the LFO? Um, you can use almost any capacitor there in terms of material. You don't want to use electrolytic, but uh, my preference uh, is to use a MLC 1,000 volt, one kilovolt MLC. And I'll use Murata or uh, uh, typically Murata. Uh, there's some other good brands that Mauser and Digikey carry. Uh, because it there's no audio that goes through it, I want a capacitor that's going to be high tolerance and like if I want a 20 nanofarad and a 10 nanofarad I want them to actually be that I want them to be that every time and I don't want something that's ever going to fail due to the to the voltage present and I'm not interested in it becoming microphonic down the line the old uh, z-class uh, that fender used those things die all the time in old fenders because they just that ceramic just absorbs moisture and uh, stops working that's the number that and the and a bad LDR the number one causes of of dead trims in old fenders. But uh, so you can use orange drops, you can use Mallory 150Ms, anything you want. I find it longest term, and it kind of looks pretty to have three blue ones, uh, the uh, the blue Murata MLCs. But this, that's just for longevity and a street size kind of point of view. Yeah, I look forward to when you guys get to really hear the basement, especially the changes I made on that custom channel. Um, I'll be putting some of those loops to use. But the, the downside of looped things, of, of reamped tracks, is that it does not show you how a pickup and the speaker and the amp interact. So you're not going to get that feedback and, and the harmonic content. Loops are great for clean stuff, but um, it's only part of the puzzle. Thanks, Natas. Appreciate that. Todd Janney says it's raining there, so I'm I'm beginning to catch up to where I was at the beginning of the chat. Uh, hey, Natas, you can you can pull the preamp tube on the normal channel. You'll get a little more little bit more gain out of the the uh, reverb channel, vibrato channel. Uh, do not disconnect two speakers on your super reverb. Uh, most super reverbs have 20 or 30 watt rated speakers and they chose four of them to handle the output of that 45 watt amp and if you disconnect two unless you have you know if, if you have like 50 watt or higher speakers and you have two of those you're fine but most most super reverb original speakers are closer to 20 watts uh, or 25 and if you only have two of them they will die um, there are better ways to, to lose. Uh, uh, you're not going to get any earlier breakup with only two speakers. You're going to have the same amount of breakup, just going to be a little bit less output, about 6 dB. But, uh, you know, if you have a 75 Super Reverb, does it have a master volume? Uh, let's see. Hey, Reckless. Yeah, Vibroverb reissues are not great. Vibrolux reissues are good. Get the 65, never ever the 68. If you get the 68, it can be made good, but it takes an awful lot of work. The 65 is almost there to begin with. Um, as to what to watch out for, things to watch out for, see my Fender reissues playlist. I've shown exactly what to do, What, in fact, what a lot of owners can do themselves. Uh, plus also the, the Fender FAC videos and the tone stack videos I've got a lot of stuff out there that'll answer your question in depth hey divided by time okay yeah for compound radius I think is a big selling point for for a lot of people as like ooh it has this I find most people tend to say, I like a nine and a half, or I like a 10, or I like a 12, and then you don't have to think about it, and it's certainly a lot easier next time you get a fret job, because a, a well-executed compound radius is a very expensive, time-consuming proposition. Uh, John agrees with me, so I must be right. I don't know what the future of Marshall is. I don't know what the future of Fender is. I know um, that Fender very much is looking at the Tone Master as step one uh, at, uh, of achieving their goal of not being dependent on the tube supply to be able to make amps. 
and that that's a re, that's a, a realistic, reasonable thing. We we all companies need to find a way to give us the sounds we want without relying on tubes because they're not going to be around forever, and the quality uh, is much less than it used to be, et cetera, et cetera. So Fender's game plan is, you know, I think the Tone Master is their uh, opening shot, though they've tried with the XDs and stuff before, to wean themselves from tubes. I imagine Marshall is working on something similar. Someone needs to in, in, uh, invent good, affordable plug-in tube replacements, not just for new production amps, but to say, hey, it's, it's 2047 and it's time to put tubes in this 67 basement. There are no tubes anymore. Well, plugging these things, they sound like 6L6s. Plugging these things, they sound like 12X7s. They're $20 each or whatever the equivalent is in, in 20 years from now. And the app thinks it has old tubes. That's what the entire industry needs to come up with. But that's going to be a very expensive proposition that only pretty much the entire industry, or at least the leaders like Fender and, and Marshall, could achieve. So maybe they're already doing that. Uh, I imagine that they are. In the meantime, Marshall seems to be just cutting costs as much as possible. Uh, every amp that comes out is worse than the last one as far as reliability. You know, I'll, the DSL-40C and the DSL-100H are good for the price point. They're not as well built as they used to be and not as well built as they should be for the price. But given other things of that same price in the market, they're okay. Um uh, I have not seen the new JVM in person. I have seen photos, and I'm not optimistic, based on the Studio Vintage and the uh, the uh, uh, Origins, which it's, are very similar in construction. But maybe they're wonderful, and they just cosmetically look like pieces of shit wrapped in expensive wrappers. Um, Marshall continues occasionally to put out like a 60th anniversary hand-wired heritage thing that's usually okay, except the Transformers are shit. People pay an awful lot of money for that. So, you know, if I sound jaded, it's because Marshall and Fender used to be the torchbearers. They used to be the standard. And their own standards have just... Leo Fender never thought like a stockholder. Do you want a, a stockholder making all the decisions, or, or do you want an amp designer, someone who's really interested and in, in invested in music? But honestly, unless Fender and and Marshall uh, really get their shit together uh, in 10, 15, 20 years, they're going to be jokes because you can already get a neural DSP thing or the Kemper or the, the Helix system like John uses and plug into a solid state, uh, essentially small PA and have all your profiles and all your IRs and you're about 90% there already. 10 years from now, the digital stuff is going to be there. I mean, it, it just is. Um, I mean, I take my iPad or whatever replaces the iPad and connect the, the you know, wirelessly. My guitar goes into that. It goes in the playback system. And, uh, you know, there it is. And these will be wonderful anachronistic curiosities that I hope are still around and people still make music with them, but they would not be... Um, the leading edge, and not and they wouldn't really be necessary anymore. Of course, I'm always hoping that people will get the fidelity better on all these modeling systems, and that the technology is really there. Meanwhile, half the digital pedals on the market go because no one designing digital actually listens to audio. And meanwhile, half the consumers are just listening to badly compressed things on Spotify with little white stems where you can't hear any of the, the highs or lows, and it's just this mid-range shout. I'm not shouting at clouds, man. Those clouds are real, and it's their fault. I know I come across as a bitter old man sometime. I'm not actually old. I turned white at 30, so... Hey, Leaf. Um, I hate to be the bearer of, of bad news, but I, I would not hang on to any PRS amp. I would sell them while people want to buy them. I have not tried the new HRX20, HDX20. I wish, I wish, I wish that the name for that thing were not so similar to the Stomp 
thing that, that Line 6 has. I always confuse those things. So maybe that, I've heard good things about that one. Maybe that one's better. I've seen pictures of the inside. It seems to be better built than many others. But the Sanzeras and the SEs and the uh, Custom Cs and the Custom Hs have all been terrible. And uh, I don't understand why PRS gets the guitars so right and the amps always have obvious fatal flaws in my experience. But maybe the new 20 is better. Hey, John. Yeah. Um, channel switching amps. The trouble with a channel switching amp is that to do it right, you end up with something very expensive. And to do it inexpensively, so many sacrifices have to be made. Uh, you, you end up with things like, you know, at, at the lower end of the spectrum, the Marshall DSL-40CR, where you have a good clean, a good crunch, and a good lead. You don't have a phenomenal clean. You don't have a phenomenal lead. You don't have a phenomenal Marshall crunch. You know, Malcolm was never going to, you know, Angus and Malcolm could never have used that amp uh, live, live on stage. But for top 40, for guys in their bedroom, for the average band, it's close enough, you know. So there are a lot of compromises there. And then there's also heat issues. So then you get into the mesas, which don't know how to d deal with heat issues, and their clean channel is noisier than their dirty channel because they have high uh, resistance resistors and series on the clean stuff, and all and 400 volt caps that leak, and all these problems I've documented. But there's a lot of stuff there, and they charge a lot for it, and with these terrible little pots with plastic shafts that physically fall apart. Um, to do it right is expensive. And uh, at the price point where people are looking at doing it right, say the Sur PT100 or the older Sur uh, CAE Custom 100, a lot of the guys who can afford the amp where it's done right, where you really have two or three channels implemented really well, are also looking at things like uh, whether the new Synergy thing with the, with the modular replacements, or they're like, I don't need an amp that does all that. I'll have my Twins for my clean, I'll have my Marshall for my rhythm, and I'll have my Soldano for my lead. So you're talking a very different price point. And so what the market says it wants versus what the market will support can be a very different thing. Um, I would find most players would have a better experience especially with the lower stage volumes that you get today. If you were to have a Friedman uh, Runt 20 or Runt 50 or Dirty Shirley or what, you know, flavor of choice uh, in a 1x12 or 2x12 cab or get the combo and a Deluxe Reverb or a Vibrolux Reverb or I think you've got a Pro Reverb uh, and it can be one of the reissues. And then AB, AB Box and, you know, so many options now with switching and say, hey, when I'm clean, I'm going to have this. When I'm dirty, I'm going to have this. That's going to be a, a much better sounding rig if you just kind of say, I'm going to use my discrete amp, my discrete overdrive, my discrete screaming distortion. So putting all those together into one amp well can be very problematic. Um, you know, and someone dismissed uh, my video of the AC15 Custom the other day saying, it's a one-trick pony and it's all jangly and and it doesn't have good overdrive. Well, he obviously didn't hear Steve Selvage uh, play through one with the 335 straight in. Uh, players have perceptions of amps, and there's nothing you can do about that. You can't say, well, everything you're saying is wrong. I just want you to know that. Uh, so people want what they want, and when they want something, they end up hearing it, even if it's not really there. Uh, seriously, man, given how far down the helix line you're at uh, I think your money is better spent just staying with helix and pedals into a really good sounding clean amp for live and then studio you know all right I'm gonna b borrow my buddy's uh, Marshall uh, super bass for this and I'm gonna borrow my other buddies or I'm gonna rent a Soldano for this I'm gonna go do my record but live you don't want to be touring with all that stuff and you probably also also don't want a big multi-channel 100 watt head. I should mention my buddy Jason Tong here, by the way. Head first amplification. Head fist. Uh, Australian guy has got an amp called the Alta 100, which also does 
very good uh, multi-channel stuff. But again, it's at that price point. Where we started the video, where we talked about the $4,000 telly, and you get in the high-end multi-channel switching stuff that does it well, you're in that same price range. Yeah, Chris, my thought is that most guys set up to do this are going to have a DI box. So plug the Strat or whatever into the DI box, run out of that into your computer, record that, but run the through from the DI out to your app. And if, you, if you're playing a clean sound, just let me know, hey, I did this with, with a twin. I, I was playing through an AC-30. Or I was playing through a Marshall, and, you know, uh, and these are the sounds I got. Um, uh, for those who don't have a dedicated DI box, you can do it through most computer interfaces, a Focusrite or a Motu or whatever you got. And um, some guys can are set up to hear plugins and stuff. Just record a dry pass, uh, even if you're hearing plugins, uh, depending on your setup. You know, I just want the signal coming out of a guitar um, so that I can put that signal into amplifiers uh, because the technology allows us to do this today. You know, I was shouting at clouds earlier, and, and um, people often think that I'm anti-digital. I'm not. I, uh, at late night practice, I, I, I pull up a neural DSB AC15 plug-in in, my, in, my, in Logic. Um, you know, people say I, I'm, I'm an old man who doesn't understand technology. Meanwhile, I've got like eight different Apple devices and all these lights and all these cameras and I'm editing things. <laughs> you know, I'm using technology more than most people who accuse me of being a Luddite ever would. I used to be a IBM guy. Uh, uh, I know technology. Hey, Scott, no, this is spider bite. I mentioned that earlier, but, uh, I think I think I'm behind the chat. I'm always am. I'm trying to get a rev in to take a look at that uh, divided by time series. I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, uh, JDS, I've not had a vintage sound amp in. Hey, Rob F. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a third power. I wanna get a three monkeys. I wanna get a rev in. If for nothing, nothing else, just to know about uh, those companies because I hear great things, but I've not heard one, I've not played one, let alone seen inside one. Hey, Jaska, no, I've not seen John Hewitt's Simple Attenuator in the Marshall Forums. I don't hang out in the Marshall Forums. I, I get mad. Um, I see so much mis mis misinformation and... Uh, utter garbage advice and uh, uh, snobbery, um, unearned snobbery. So I stay out of those forums. The guys I know in the industry who really do this, who really know the marshals, A, tend to be too busy to hang out on the forums too much, and B, when they do go in the forums, they get told that they're wrong. I, I don't like that. Hey, uh, Michael Rigsby, the uh, Crate Vintage Club models are really good. Um, some of them, the construction of how the chassis is put into the combo is really hard to get out. you got to hold your mouth just right and twist the speaker and stuff. But the amps themselves are really well built. Uh, good Wemas in there, good radial caps, really good boards, uh, good goodish pots. Uh, there's, other than re needing recaps and occasional resistor swaps or, and, and tubes, there's nothing wrong with those Crate Vintage Club series uh, other than time, but that can be undone, as you saw to an extreme with that 67 basement this morning. Reckless Toboggan, uh, I, uh, I think I answered your question already, but yeah, go with the 65 reissue. Let's see. So you got a base cab, studio base cab, and the twin chassis fits perfectly. It's closed back. Yeah, it's okay to put a reverb tank in the closed back cab. Just make sure that it's secure, not going to be bang banging around, and that the cables can go out. Um, that won't hurt the reverb thing. Um, a closed back versus open back, that's not enough of information for me to know the dimensions. The dimensions are critical. But in general, with a twin that has a lot of power, um, you're going to have a lot more low end in a closed back cab than an open back cab. 
So a lot of the, the, the speakers that are popular choices in an open backed are going to be boomy and woofy in there. So I would look at things that are popular from Marshalls, vintage 30s, uh, 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 greenbacks, even a GT75. But the best thing you can do is try to play um, y- your amp or a similar twin through your buddy's cab that's sealed and closed back, um, especially if you can find a two by 12 of similar dimensions and say, hey, I like that or I don't like that, I like that, what do you got in there? In Minutes Legends, okay, that's bad, bad, bad for instance, those are gonna be too boomy in that cab, but you know. Uh, the speakers are a very crucial part of it and you can, you know, I've got a lot of them featured on my channel but they're almost all in open back cabs and it's really hard to get across how drastically the cabinet affects the sound of the speaker and the dimensions it's not just open back or close back it's it's all kinds of stuff if you can hear it for yourself before buying hey magisterium i have not worked on a fender mustang because they usually cost less than my hour, uh, hourly rate for uh, two hours which is my minimum charge unless i'm feeling generous so i have no experience with them sorry hey jimmy pete ooh 64 bandmaster you can rewire the bandmaster cab so that the two four ohm speakers are in are in series which will give you um 16 ohms versus four and then you could use the 16 ohm head into that or you could use an 8 ohm head uh, into the 4 ohm setup as it is now you don't don't use a 16 ohm output into that amp with a 4 ohm load unless you rewire it to be 16 ohms which you can by changing it from parallel to series um, but make sure if you do that that each speaker is rated um, for the output of, of the head you're using it with um, Vox got away with it to a degree in the AC30 with series 15 watt speakers, but they still do fail. Uh, and if I had control over Judgment Day, every amp out there that had series uh, speakers, each speaker in the series would have wattage uh, able to handle the entire amp. Uh, but you can you can mismatch 16 to 8. You can ma- mismatch 8 to 4, or 4 to 8, or 8 to 16. You don't want to have a 4 to 16 ohm mismatch. That's when things get squirrely. Hey, Mr. Spillify. Yeah, I've been inside some two rocks. Not not had any on the channel, but I've been doing this longer than I've had the channel. They're good. They're, they're very good. Um, I think people think they're better than they are or that they'll magically make you play like your guitar hero of choice. Um, None of whom started off playing in Dumbles and Two Rocks. They all started off in whatever they had. Uh, you know, I've often said that Robin Ford sounds great through his Dumbles. Robin Ford sounds great through Two Rocks. Robin Ford would have sounded great if he just stuck with a 66 Super Reverb, which is also a great amp. Um, yeah, Two Rocks are, are really good, and they're well-built. Um, people complain about the price. I don't know how many employees they have. I don't know what their distribution's like. I don't know what their shipping's like. You know, I don't know what the, they have. They have, to have. they have to pay taxes. They have to uh, pay insurance for employees. They have to uh, 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 pay transportation fees on things. They've got to buy cardboard boxes. All these things have literature printed up. It's not like, hey, it co- uh, the parts to make this amp were twelve hundred dollars, and I'm selling it for four thousand dollars. That's all pure profit. You know, it's it's a business. So, uh, the in any business, the more of something you can sell. The, the less expensive that thing can be. So Fender puts out a lot of crap at relatively low prices. T-Rock puts out a very small amount in comparison of very good stuff. Their prices are not going to be comparable to Fender's. They're going to be higher. You get what you pay for. Uh, if you go back and look at a price list from Fender musical instruments in the 60s and adjust for inflation, a twin reverb was a $3,500, $4,000 amp a uh, deluxe reverb was about a $2,700 amp. Uh, today, a deluxe reverb new is $1,600, but for years uh, and, and years before COVID, a deluxe reverb reissue was about $1,200. A twin rever- reissue was about $1,400. So we've, we've lived for a long time with artificially low prices, and they're still artificially low, even though they have come up since all the supply chain disruptions.
Hey, Diesel. Yeah, I saw some pictures of the new MiG-50 in uh, Brad's stream yesterday, but I've not seen what, the full amp in front of me. Uh, the old the old Softec MiGs were really odd things. They were cheaply assembled things done with surplus uh, Soviet hardware. So capacitor form factors that we don't use in the, in the West, pots that we don't use in the West. Um, and they were just copies of Marshalls. You had the 87, you had the um, and the uh, 2204 copies, basically. Uh, and they sound, they can sound fantastic as long as they're running, but as soon as something goes wrong, those old Softec um, MiG-50s needed a lot, a lot of work because you couldn't just say, I'll put a new can cap in there. You had to say, well, how am I going to mount this thing? Uh, how do I even get this whole thing out? Because they used a screw that no one uses in the West uh, and has been made since 1989. Um from what I can tell, the electroharmonics is not copying all the craziness of that. It's just a seemingly fairly cheaply made stock, uh, a straight up copy of, of the old Marshalls. So until I have one on my bench, I cannot tell you whether it's good, bad, or ugly, but it looks to be much better built than the old uh, soft deck ones. But uh, beyond that, I cannot speculate. Hey, David James, answer your, your trim questions. But uh, the uh, if you're asking about, if you mean literally the tremolo circuit, the only caps in that tremolo circuit are the three caps that are ceramic. The rest of the fender stuff, any good polyester film cap will give you an appropriate sound. Let's see. Hey, Josh Roberts. Oh, I should remember to do this kind of stuff once in a while. Hey, Brian Bass or Brian Bass, I have not encountered any dark gene mini amp heads. If it seems too good to be true, let's see. I'm reading through to find questions. Uh, Rob F., I don't want to talk about what this 67 restoration costs on here because then people expect uh, every, either expect every repair to cost that much and they'll, they'll, they won't knock on my door or they'll, they'll, uh, they'll bring one in that cannot be saved and they'll be like, hey, you did that one. I just Some stuff I like to keep off offline. Oh, you're right. You're right, Matt. I'm watching the chat as myself rather than logged in as Sonic Auto. That's why I couldn't make uh, people um, mods. In fact, let me fix that real quick. Thank you, Matt. Sorry. I should use my big brain for this. So, let me go into the live chat. I've got to wait for the stupid ad. I hate these ads too. I wouldn't do that to you except it's the only way that I can guarantee that YouTube will show you my stuff. All right, so now let me make a couple of you regulars in here some mods just to kick bots on my behalf. Let's see. All right, Wes, you're now a standard moderator and Matt Fields. Standard moderator. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you both. Just kick bots and, and chew, chew gum. Uh, thank you for reminding me how the world actually works there, Matt. I was just talking about how technologically savvy I am. I'm just doing too many things at once. And I forgot that I was logged in as myself rather than uh, the channel on the iPad. Okay. Uh, reckless toboggan. That's the third time I've seen that question. Let me ask everyone: um, if you ask a question, other than at the very beginning where I ask you to repaste, uh, re, you know, copy and paste it, uh, please ask just once because uh, it, it just makes the the chat longer for no good reason. I will answer every question I can as I come to it. 
Hey, Coos, if, uh, if, if the filter caps are in series, that's uh, going to be th th there to handle more than 500 volt caps. So don't replace them with a single 500 volt caps unless you are sure, 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 absolutely positive that the unloaded B plus will not exceed 500 volts. There's some other tricks to some of the, uh, the Marshall stuff where the series cap is also used uh, uh, to the HD center tapped. So it depends on the model. Uh, I think you'd be more likely to run into that on 100 watt than 50 watt, but uh, without having your Sovtech in front of me, I cannot tell you that for sure. I do not have any experience, Butcher, Pete, with the Univox B Group apps. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, nickel plating um, would have added greatly to the time and the cost. And uh, sadly, um, you know, these things are factors. I did. I took steps to seal it against rust uh, coming up in the future. But um, nickel plating would be, would be nice. But then I'd have to go and find, you know, what are the good machine shops or whoever in town who do that? Do they really do it? Do they really do it well? Is their nickel plating going to really be conductive? Is it not going to wear off? You know, I just don't want to spend the client's money and the time on something and then find out that the place did a crappy job that started to flake off after six months. Um, I am not familiar with the PRS MT15, uh, NYC Geology, sorry. Hey, Chris Butler. Yeah, I've got the Kinman's older ones in my Eric Johnson, and I've got the Mojo Tone uh, Quiet Coil 67s in the Rosewood Neck Strat. And I think they sound really good. Um, they are a little bit bright, but then that's the, the whole thing of the 67s. And I've had 58s here in my buddy's Strat, Hal's, and I thought they sounded really good. I thought they weren't quite as good as the Kinmans, but they were very, very good. I thought they were a lot better than the, um, a lot better than any of the Fender Noiseless I've played, and a lot better than the um, uh, DiMarzio areas that were in there before, which to me had a very plasticky attack. Um, you know, if you ever play a bridge humbucker and it just got that real hard edge to the attack, some stacked humbuckers, noiseless single coils, have that, and I thought the areas did too. Um, uh, so uh, I think that the uh, Mojotone uh, quiet coils are great. I think Kinnamans are better, but my God... Yeah, again, it gets to that small business thing I talked about with the price of Two Rock and, of course, shipping from Australia and getting parts if you are running a business in Australia. So I, I have no um, I have no criticism of Chris Kennan for his pricing, but they are very expensive things. I I I don't know that I personally deserve the uh, the Kimmons and the EJ, but when pro players come over, I think that's when they they earn their keep. Hey, David Fuller, uh, when you're turning off a valve amp, just turn off the power. Standby has no role in um, powering off. It's just there for powering on. It's primarily there as marketing in most amps. Some amps need standby. Many amps which have standby do not. Many of those amps which do not need the standby are actually damaged by standby. Have poor implementation. See my Vox Custom Classic videos and see the videos the other day on the... Um, um, Dr. Z Route 66s where they have a very poor standby implementation. But unless you get a massive pop when you power off the amp, you don't need to use standby first. And if you get a massive pop when you power off the amp, there's something else wrong with that amp. Uh, I will make one exception. One exception. Some, some amps uh, have multi-channels. Uh, when you power them off, the relay switch first and when the relay switch, it go the relays can pop, or the relays can go to a, an ultra mega loud lead sound all of a sudden before it turns off. So if you have a Marshall uh, JVC series, not JVC, yeah, JV is that right? The JVMs. If you have a Marshall JVM and it it makes an awful sound when you power it off, you can power, you can use the standby switch there, but you're using it as a mute. But as far as safety. If the app doesn't pop when you power it off, just power it off. Uh, thanks, Max Bialystock. 
How's the production on, on the new musical coming? All right, we're going to take a break because we're right here at one hour. And I uh, hope everyone will still be here in about seven minutes. And we'll get to David James' question about Transformer brands and what options we have. So see you guys in seven.
And we're back. the tone thing on these Gretches, and the tone switch is noisy on this. This is a buddy's Gretch. This, this switch was noisy, this switch still is, this one no longer is. The master volume was noisy, it no longer is. The output jack, as you just heard, hopefully, uh, cuts in and out, that's gonna get fixed. But it's an awfully nice guitar to play, and uh, especially if I had some reverb dialed in. <laughs> play up here and I can barely play anyway most days but playing up here on camera anyway later I'll dust off some Mike Campbell maybe some some Chet I'm kidding about the Chet I can barely pull off Scotty Moore on a good day but uh nice guitar fun I don't like that color but Brian Jones would have approved. The anniversary. I even have a matching pick. All right, where were we? Sorry. It's not all guitars, guitars, guitars. Before we get back to the questions, um, I'm hearing a hum out of that 67 uh, that was not audible probably to you guys, and it wasn't audible in the uh, backing tracks I put in that video that came out this morning because the level was down. But I have that hum is just a old tube in V1. If I pull V1, it goes away. Uh, had a tongue saw in there, uh, and that thing was a humming beast. And the hum has decreased dramatically with a different tube. But it's got some good tubes coming. I expect that hum to go away. There's no hum in the output whatsoever. All right, where were we? David James and Transformer Brands. Uh, Weber uh, tr transformers are garbage. Avoid them. They're Chinese. Not, not that there's, it's not, oh, I hate Chinese things, but those are made to a very low cost and they're poorly made. Avoid them. They are the cheapest of the cheap. Uh, Hammond traditionally has been great. I had a very bad experience with two Hammond transformers in a row recently. It's a reverb. Uh, driver transformer for a fender. The first one came with a, a shorted primary and um, I called the vendor and Hammond sent me a directly replacement in the same model number but all the dimensions were different. It physically would not fit in the fender without redrilling which I'm not going to do to a vintage fender so they have changed the dimensions but on the same part number that makes no sense to me and um, I contacted the vendor and said look they're both duds just give me my, my money back the vendor gave me my money back. I didn't think about it again. And then I, I get an email saying that my account's about to be suspended because Hammond never received either payment or the original back that they apparently wanted the first one back, the dud, and I had not been informed of that. So I, I threw both of the pieces of garbage away. Uh, I've got, life is too short for me, and Hammond was really ugly about it. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I even had it in a, one of the videos showing the dead transformer and the bad replacement. And I sent them a link and said, if you want to argue with me, here it is. I told you I had a, a shorted primary. I'm not sending you this thing back. I'm not going to go to the post office and deal with that, even though I'd already thrown it away. I said it's shorted. It's shorted. I said the replacement was a, was, was a bad joke. It was. This is not something that should be sold for fenders. That said, all the other Hammonds I've used have always been great. I'm hoping this is a blip. But I'm a little bit worried if that's a change in the in the in the company's direction. Haybor is great. Um, they they were severely affected by COVID as far as availability. They seem to be coming back in stock more and more. Mojo Tone is one of the better places to get them. There's another vendor whose name escapes me right now. Um, other brands like Pacific etc. are more OEM things. Uh, Classic Tone is dearly missed. 
Mercury is great, uh, but most Mercuries are, I think, too expensive for individuals to buy. Uh, if I get a Mercury for you, if you're, if you're my customer and your app needs a transformer and I choose them, I think the Mercury is the best choice. The price I pay for that Mercury is a lot, a lot, a lot less than you would pay for it, and I would pass that savings on to you. So from my perspective, uh, uh, Mercury is usually maybe 10 to $30 more than uh, uh, Habor, which is usually tw maybe $20 more than uh, Hammond. Those are the three that I would look at for the most part. And as most of you do not have the same pricing tiers that I get, I would look at Hammond and Habor. Let's see here. Hey, Alan Harvey from Stockholm. Won't mention the weather. Let's see. Uh, hey, DMAC, avoid the Super Champ X2s. Avoid any of the Fender X2 series. They have a DSP card in there that Fender no longer makes, Fender no longer offers. When that DSP dies, the amp dies with it. And if that's uh, there's a concept that stockholders have imposed on the industry called end of life, end of product life. So uh, when Fender came out with all those XDs and X2s, they said, this is the future, everyone needs to buy one of these. And then they changed to the newer, greater model, and then they abandoned the old ones. Um, and, and have no support or parts available for the old ones. So once it dies, it dies. Uh, I mean, in theory, I could design a new DSP card for you, but that'd be probably a $75,000 project. Uh, I, don't, I don't recommend that you have anyone make anything custom for that. Uh, it's, so avoid those. Uh, I think Fender just routinely shits on their customers. Hey, Tommy Mitchell, um, you can send me an email, but I'm so backed up. I'm, I'm just opening the floodgates a little bit at a time, letting things in. It's, it's, I, it's a good problem to have, and I'm very grateful. But I, many more people see the videos and want me to work on amps than I can possibly do. So uh, send me an email, and may, maybe I, I, you can come in. If not, I might be able to find uh, a tech closer to you. I don't know where in Indiana you are. But I know an awful lot of good techs all across the country, and I would be glad to um, make recommendations as necessary. Hey, SS, I asked, my, I answered the question on Victory Amps earlier, a similar question earlier in the chat. And but Jeff Harper, I answered questions about the PRS Amps earlier in the chat. So after this, go back and watch the first half hour or so that you'll get that. Hey, James Blessed in Scotland. I love... I love that people are here from all over the world. Um, it, it really makes me happy because one of the things I love about travel is that I get to meet people who live entirely different lives than I do. And, uh, you know, I, so making friends, making acquaintances all over the world makes my mind grow. Everything else just makes my belly grow. Jeff Mazai, uh, my opinion on the Mesa Fillmore series in California apps is that they are still Mesas and they're designed by idiots um, who do not know the first thing about how to design an app to last. They keep making stupid mistakes. Uh, if a team keeps scoring touch, uh, self touchdowns, you know, they keep going into their own end zone. <laughs> Caps have voltage ratings. If the voltage, if the DC voltage across that capacitor is higher than that rating, that cap will fail. Before it completely fails, it will leak DC. Diodes have current ratings, power ratings. If you exceed that, the diode will fail. Before the diode flat out fails, it will cause a lot of heat. If that heat is right up against a PCB, it will burn said PCB. Um, Things which have X amount of current need a certain amount of space from, from each other so that they don't arc from one to the next. So if you have two tiny little traces right next to each other, uh, they want to arc. 
make them farther apart. For that matter, if there's current, make them wider. And if you put a conformal coating on your board so nothing tarnishes, make sure it does not become conductive because then everything starts to arc through the conformal coating. I could go on. Uh, Mesa should not be supported. It doesn't matter if they make one app that's not as bad as the others. It's still bad. It's still disrespectful to you. You know, tantalum caps, uh, bad switching, really cheap pots at really inflated prices. <sighs> They're abysmal. All right, I'm getting some of the same questions again. Hey, Paul. Yeah, I'll play through the app as well as using some of the viewer loops, Paul. Um, like I said earlier, uh, the, the loops are great for the clean stuff, but to show pickup speaker amp interaction, you have to have real time playing with the pickups right there. Um, I, I'm probably going to get someone in. I know I'm going to get two people in at least to play that thing. Uh, I know that I'm going to get my buddy Hal to come in and play a bit. And then the owner of the amp, uh, is a uh, pro rock guitar guy, and I bet he would have time to do a little demo for us as well. But uh, if he comes in, if he has the time, everyone be very polite to Scott because he can bench press us all. Hey, Jimmy Mac. No, a 5e3 does not need a standby. That would be of no benefit whatsoever. If you're copying a Fender, if you're building a, f a Fender clone, with the exceptions of, of how the power wiring is done as far as a th three conductor and, and hot and neutral remaining hot and neutral and hot being fused, then switched. Other than that, do do everything Leo did. Um, years down the path of working on amps, at that point you may be to the point where you can improve upon what Leo did or second guess it. But most people will be much better off by doing exactly what Leo did. And not just what it shows on the layout, but actually looking at vintage examples. Because the layout may just show this wire goes from here to here, but the reality was the wires were twisted in a certain way, and they weren't routed over here, they were routed over here. Every little thing, how the pots are grounded, uh, how everything is done, copy it precisely. As far as speakers and tubes for the 5e3, for, for tubes, you'd go with the best thing that's currently available. Uh, I would suggest uh, Tube Amp Doctor Red Bass uh, or, or Electro Harmonic 6v6s six, six these days. When the tongue saws come back, those are also very good, but they're not, they're not available right now. As far as speakers for 5e3s, you have a lot of wiggle room there. Um, uh, uh, the, the old... Uh, Jensen Alnicos are great. Some of the Rishu Jensen Alnicos are okay once they lose their brightness. Weber Alnicos can still be great choices, though they, they've had some quality issues. Um, Alessandro uh, Eminence is a good choice. Um, uh, Celestian Blue or the Weber Blue Dog or the Warehouse Black and Blue would be a great choice. Um, I would also think that the ET65 or Veteran 30 would be a great choice, as would a Vintage 30 but they're all gonna sound different. So once you build the amp, it's pretty easy to play that amp into other speakers and then find out that's what I'm looking for. That's, that's, the, that's the X factor that was missing. Ah, Calypso, Calypso. Did you add, did you consider applying any galvanizing solution to that rusty basement chassis you restored? Um, I debated putting this in the, in the video today, but I, I focused on the positive. I went down a terrible, terrible sequence of events with, with uh, trying to seal that chassis. I read so many things on car repair forums and machinist forums and all this stuff and all these products that people recommended that were supposed to be great. And I chose a product uh, based on everyone's recommendation. Everyone just said this thing was great. Um, I chose a product called uh, uh, Permasol uh, Flow, an oil-based, and it's basically a mixture of naphtha and linseed oil, and it's supposed to soak into the steel and really give a nice uh, sturdy film layer that would be impervious to rust and just seal things in. And man, I had to do multiple. I had to do two coats, top and bottom, let each one dry 24 hours. I did all that. 
it was you know not going to be conductive. I knew that going ahead. So I had taped off places where I didn't want it to be, like where the brass control panel would be or where the chassis would contact the mesh metal top of uh, the cabinet. And I'd already done the solder connections for the grounds, knowing that I could cl- spot clean those and add more solder and do that. And um, man, it came out really glossy. And everyone had said that this thing was a mat and that they, they, they would then put a, a polyurethane over that. It came, <coughs> it came out really shiny, glossy. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just use some triple O steel wool or scotch Bright and scuff it, give it a satin finish. That didn't work. It, it, little streaks came up. And I thought, well, maybe no one will notice that. And uh, I went to put everything together and, I had a little bit, a little bit of. Um, I, I was about a third of the way putting everything back together, and I had a little spatter of um, flux. So I took some uh, isopropyl on a paper towel and wiped that flux up, and a big swath of that uh, of that permasol just bubbled and dissolved from isopropyl. And I put some more isopropyl on there, and just like a a craculature appeared on everything. I'm like fuck. So I took everything back out of the app, undid all the work I'd done, gave it a bath in acetone, got all that bullshit off, let that dry, and then I soaked the damn thing for a day in heavy, a heavy application of WD-40 and then wiped off the excess and left a film on top of everything. Uh, and that WD-40 is in the pores of the steel and there's a thin film on everything. It feels slightly oily to the touch, very slightly. Uh, it's conductive. I was able to solder through it, no issues at all. That's That and not storing it in a damn shed outside in Mississippi should be enough if the amp is taken care of at this point. But damn. Yeah, so um, I went through so many things with metal, different people who do this with metal, but no one else... Uh, doing this kind of thing seems to care whether the uh, about conductivity or shielding, or, or et cetera, et cetera. So there's some unique things in this field. Let's see. People talking to each other about their guitars. That's good. And let's see. Hey, Nick, I've not experienced uh, uh, Greg's lead and bass 35 models, but every Germino I've had in has been really, really good. He knows what he's doing, and they're well-built, and uh, there's, uh, I have no on the other hands about them. They're just really good examples of, of Marshall-inspired apps. Hey, Hugh, I'm glad you uh, got a Bella. I think you're going to be very happy with the Sir Bella. It's a very good amp. Um, John does everything right, just like Greg does. A lot of power conditioners are marketing bullshit or essentially just a power strip with a little uh, capacitor filtering uh, between hot and neutral. Uh, Serious power conditioners, the stuff that touring bands use to make sure that they have a consistent, uh, clean voltage even from a dirty generator those cost four thousand dollars and up so odds are you don't have acdc's budget or pink floyd's budget etc cetera, etc cetera. most guys don't need a power conditioner um i've got one in my studio i've got the only thing from monster i would ever buy by the way monster as a company is is pretty crappy i've got a monster power pro 2500 i've had it for about 20 years now actually and what I liked about it back when I had a uh, it was powering a, a full studio is that it had a timed sequence of when to power things on and off so my speakers would turn off uh, before uh, the, the power amp would turn off uh, before or after the thing feeding it whatever so there wouldn't be pops and I still use it for two reasons uh, it tells me what the wall voltage is at all times and it shuts off the power if the wall voltage goes over 129 volts um, but it, it, I've compared the sound of things 
straight into the wall versus through it. it it's not conditioning anything. It's just got some features which are useful to me. Um, most power conditioners are not any different than you get at a $15 power strip from, from uh, Home Depot. And those lightning guarantees? No. Sorry, no. Good luck getting anyone to pay out on that stuff. Hey, Natas, yeah, just use the master volume if you need to turn the output down and then turn the preamp up. You'll get plenty, of, you'll get lower headroom without having the master volume add, uh, you know, with, you know, without the volume increase. Uh, if your 75 master volume's got a bright cap on it, a little ceramic doohickey, snip that off. It sounds awful on that circuit. Uh, take off that cap and the master volume sounds eminently better on those things. Uh, you got four uh, Raging Cajun uh, Patriots. You're fine. You could run just two, but you'd have an impedance mismatch, and that's not what you want. Um, and there's no way to. There's only one tap uh, on that, so you can't do a deliberate mismatch of, well, this is the load and this is the tap. You know, just use the master volume. Um, it's it's a good one. Snip out that cap if necessary. Uh, JDS, uh, you should, you should not be getting a loud pop for, with a Catalan. If you're getting a loud pop with a Catalan, contact Catalan. A lot of companies don't wire their pedals correctly, but I don't want to, uh, besmirch Catalan bread in case, um, um, that's not the problem. I don't know what your rig is. Uh, when there's a loud pop when you're engaging a pedal like that, it's usually either a, a true bypass switch is, which is wired incorrectly um, or you've got a, a leaking capacitor in the output of, of this of the pedal. I don't know whether that pedal does true bypass. I don't know whether the pedal does a buffered bypass. I don't know the circuitry. Uh, if, if, if there's any capacitor in line and it's got a leak, you could have a pop. Um, the other thing that can happen is it's just a momentary pop because at the moment of switching, the input of the amp or the impact input of the next device has no ground reference there. Um, and that can be fixed with what's called a bleeder resistor, like a 3 meg or 4.7 meg from the output, just across the output jack from tip to sleeve. But if you do that to a bunch of pedals, then you, over time, you're adding a lot of you're, you're changing the load on your guitar quite a bit. But that's one of the things that it's... Um, uh, what's the best way to put this? When you're looking at rigs, sometimes the problem is not just this. It's this in conjunction with this being used with, with this. So um, uh, it's, it's fun uh, troubleshooting this stuff. But that's, that's all the long ad distance advice I can give you. Hey, Butcher Pete. Yeah, it's the it's the um, Indonesian standard, the eight hundred dollar one, uh, and that um, I think they call it the Sunrise Burst. Very unusual looking. I like it a lot. Um, I'll I'll be doing a video soon on this guitar. Uh, two videos. I'll be doing a review uh, showing what I like and what I dislike about it, and then a follow up video showing how I fixed the things I disliked about it. Um, overall though, for the price, I think it's great. See the beginning of this stream where I, I talked about it and you got a chance to hear it a little bit. Tommy, yeah, in my experience, Hackos are across the board better than Weber. Um, I had a 936 or 836, 936 uh, for over 10 years and I had the previous model before that and now I've got the um, FX951 which is glorious but I think uh, more than most most casual solderers would need um, but the 936 is no longer made but they have something equivalent it's about 90 to 100 bucks uh, much better than we than Weber's or, I mean, not Weber's Weller's see you said Weber so I was thinking that Weller Weller Yeah, I see you, Chris. With I tried to dye my hair for a while to keep that. I used to be have dark red hair, and uh, uh, I began to have white roots and 
look kind of crazy. It is Scott Wilcox's, uh, 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 Jim Cox, yeah. And uh, I'm sure he'll be glad to tell you more about it. But so will I in a video coming up. Leland Berg says, Paul, Paul Reed Smith knows guitars, but he has to trump some, someone else with amps. Yeah, he, the guy he's got doing the amp design, oh, I can't remember his name, real nice guy in Texas, does good designs. But I, I, I think there's the, the circuit design and there's how the factory implements it. I think there's a breakdown in communication somewhere along the way. So, let's see. Hey, personal Nadir, I, I don't know about the Marshall pedal reissues, but I've, I've worked on the originals. There's nothing in those originals that needs faithfully recreating. Uh, they're okay. They're they're okay. You know, it's funny, the whole pedal thing. People are going crazy about the boss heavy metal pedal or metal zone pedal. I don't remember what I remember when the you know, the, I remember the first time those came out and they were the thing to have and then for about fifteen years, oh my god, I can't believe you're using that old piece of shit. And now people they're in vogue again. Um, you know, rats do the same thing. People love and hate rats in a secular fashion. Um Shut up and play your guitar, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, damn clouds. Whatever works for you, works for you. If it doesn't cause noise, if it doesn't cause a problem in the rest of your series, if you've got an idea in your head and this little box let, or gadget lets you get that idea out into the world, that's great. I don't care whether it costs $750 or $75. Um, but uh, the... Uh, I've, I've fixed too many of the old Marshall blues breaker, et cetera, pedals to, to think they're fantastic. They're, 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 okay. they're all right. Pardon me. I need a mute button so I can sniff or people complain that I sniff. I sit my coffee too loudly. So here, here guys, I will mute it. Ah, it's funny the things people complain about. One guy was real mad at me the other day because he'd seen my Amp Center $1,000 video or Amp Center $500 video, I don't remember which one. And he was mad because he was only interested in, in amps for his acoustic guitars. And he thought I was misleading by saying this was an amp, a video about amps. And it was just electric, loud, probably heavy metal amps. And I want something for my acoustic. And I made the mistake of responding at all. I, I said, I'm really sorry that you're misled by the thumbnails showing lots of electric guitar amps. And then he started yelling at me about how I'm rude and sarcastic. And I said, sorry, mister, do you want your free back? And then he was mad about that. I just deleted it. But, you know, I do what I do. It's free. If you do. People complain about the free not being good enough. It's weird. If I don't like something on YouTube... I, I tip, just stop watching that video or I stop watching that channel. Um, that's the extent of my emotional investment in it. Hey, Reckless Toboggan. Yeah, um, uh, if you want to make a first amp, build a Fender Champ. Uh, don't worry about turret or through hole. Uh, you're going to be probably getting a kit. If you get the Mojo Tone kit, it will have... Um, Eyelet boards. I think Tube Depot's got a good kit too that might even be PCB. If it's a PCB, pardon me, if they sell a PCB champ, that board was designed by my buddy. Um, um, sorry, spacing his name. Rob Hull, and he's been a great friend of mine for 30 years now. Rob Hull. Sorry, Rob, if you see this. I, I really do know you. Um, and he just did an excellent job on that. I think if you're looking to build an amp and have it work easily and work on the first try, the Tube Depot uh, PCB one is the way to go. But if you want to make it just like Fender did and probably make a lot of mistakes in the process and learn about it, go with the Mojo Tone kit um, on just a simple tweed chap.
Hey, Chris Butler. Uh, he's asking if the PT-15 is also great compared to the PT-200. John's not going to put anything out that's not great. And I don't think, uh, I don't know Pete. Uh, I know John, I don't know Pete. But I don't think Pete would put his name on something that wasn't great. Um, you know, he does get paid to do reviews, but uh, he's not going to end- endorse at that level something he doesn't believe in. There, there's, it's one thing to, to get paid and say, yeah, this pedal is really cool, the sound it does, versus my name is on this thing and I want, I, I'm associated with this. So I, I don't think he's a, a shill. But I think there are levels of, of when he's going to be nice about something. If he's got his name on it, it's going to be good. And more importantly, no offense to Pete, if John puts his name on it, it's going to be great. So, yeah, I'm sure the P- PT-15 is phenomenal. I've not tried one personally, but uh, I've seen many of John's amps. Uh, I've known John for a while. I admire John, and I hope to have him on the channel at some point. Uh, I'm not saying that I want to get him on the channel, therefore I'm going to be nice about his amps. Um, I'm not sucking up to him. Put it this way. I was familiar with John's work before I met John. Being familiar with his work made me want to, to know John and, and, and made me think good things about him. It's not like, oh, this guy is successful. I'll just say nice things about his stuff. His stuff is really good and is no, no surprise that he's been successful with it. Yeah, I'm looking at at, uh, at Dave's Friedman stuff, D- Dave's uh, Princeton Fender thing. He's already done some Fender stuff um, in like the Runt 50 and stuff, and and uh, yeah, that's a, that's essentially the normal normal channel of a AB 763, and he's done some Vox stuff on the uh, BE 100 clean, uh, but you know. Yeah, that's 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 a larger subject there, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what you know, people have have um, chased the wrong logo. Uh, Friedman, John, a bunch of guys in LA have been inside a lot of the amps that have graced your record collections. And people are like, Well, what about this? You said it wasn't that great, and this guy uses it. Well, that guy who's going on tour in front of however many thousands of people a night and making all this money. He's got a guy like me who goes through his entire line of amps before they go out on tour, hopefully. Um, so, you know, you get an amp where this fails all the time. Well, that's been fixed and probably fixed in such a way it won't happen again. Um, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you don't see, you don't see. And a lot of speculation about, oh, what what's in Eddie's 68? What was done to it? Well, both these guys know. Uh, they've, they've both had that amp on their bench. And, you know... Uh, John told me what's what's been done in Eddie's 68 and you know what it sounds like a 68 it's got a little more low end than some uh, it wasn't just the amp um, I don't want to go down the, the brown, sound, brown sound quest all that stuff it'd be easy to do that all the time and just get YouTube views um, but you know it was a good example of a 68 had some unique uh some unique factory values had some subtle changes over the years in the hands of a particular odd player. Matt Scott, um, I'll, I will, I'll find your email. I'm sorry. I'm just so backed up. Uh, you're not going to do the wrong thing. Um, uh, I, it takes what it takes. And like this basement has taken, mm, so many hours and I have just the one bench at a time. So things, while I do rotate them out and I'm working on multiple things at at once, I'm just one guy and I'm still working through a backlog. I'm seeing some repeated questions again, please everyone just ask once, um, uh, makes it a lot easier for me to go through everything. Hey, Joey R I, I, I loathe, I personally loathe compressor pedals. Um, they're going to take away the amp response. You're not going to learn how to play with that. You know, you're going to have uncontrolled playing dynamics if you're always being controlled by a compressor. And you're not going to learn what the amp can really do. Um, uh, you know, for instance, you're like play soft for clean, hard for crunch. Um, yeah, you won't get hard for crunch if you have a compressor in front. Uh, unless you're just using it for a level boost, then you're not playing it hard. You're just 
using it as a bad boost pedal. Most people would, I think most players would benefit from spending more time with the guitar plugged straight into a good amp and seeing what all the things do. Um, see what your volume pot does. See what your tone pot does. See what your pickup selection and if you have like a Les Paul or whatever, your, your volume pot combinations do. See how the amp responds. What happens if I have the amp on seven and I play really soft? What happens if I have the amp on three and I really dig in? Learn that stuff. Compression is icing. Compressors are icing. Overdrives are icing. Delays are icing. Get the cake good first. Let's see. Hey, M fam. I am. I am not a Hogs fan. My grandfather was. He had that red plastic uh, Razorback cap that's worth thousands of dollars now, and he could call the Hogs. I still know how to call call the Hogs, but I'm not going to do it here. And blow out everyone's speakers, especially anyone out there listening on headphones. But uh, I don't. I don't follow sports. And my wife t teaches it at uh, ASU, so I can't do the. Uh, yeah. she, she teaches A State, so I can't do the other school. Um, but you have an SLO thirty, and been impressed with the quality. I do not know if Dave was involved with that improving that design for BAD. I don't th think you know. In all respect to Dave, and I think he'd be the first to tell you that he does not need to improve Mike Saldano's work. Uh, Mike Mike does good design. But we will see over time if. Uh, BAD boutique audio distribution maintains uh, Mike's original intent, but um, I'm glad that you like it. And uh, you know, Mike Soldano is another one of those guys who just does things right. Mike, Dave, John, Greg Germino, they're guys who just do good work, and we all need to recognize that in a, in a world full of accountants and and shareholder and blah 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 and this, and DSPs, and upgrades, and Bluetooth. It's nice when someone just says, I'm gonna make something good. You wanna buy it? Here it is, it's good. And it is. Hey, uh, Black Root Band. Um, first of all, my name's Lyle, sorry. Um, I have not seen your email about expedited work. It's possible um, that it got, some word you used triggered my spam filter. I'll go back and look. One of the problems I have with this is that here your black root band and the email might be George47 at, at Gmail. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard to keep track of all this. I get more emails than I can, I can, I can deal with, but I'll, I'll, I will look for that. Expedited is not always possible. We'll find out. Depends on what it is. Thanks, Shep. Uh, I would love to look at your at your super twin uh, in time. I don't mean to be vague. I just I don't I don't know which amps I'm going to be able to let in when. Um, William Winberg diagnosing hum from the reverb on an '80s PV solid state. Well, um, I would start with the. Uh, all the electrolytic caps in that, you know, as you got 40 plus year old electrolytic caps that were rated for 15 years, 20 years max. So beyond that, uh, that's where I would start. Let's see. Hey, John Williamson. Hey, Black Root Band, I have no concern with people using Sur reactive loads. I have no concern with people using Fryettes. I have no concern with people using uh, the Friedman box. I have heard from other techs bad things about the, the, the Boss Waza. So I personally would not recommend the Boss Waza. I have not personally had one here to show that problem, but the techs I, I, I'm referring to who aren't here to tell you themselves, so I'm not going to put too many words in their mouths, they, they said that the thing was not good or reliable. So I, I would not ever recommend it based on their advice. Um, the problem with a Sur or a 
or a Fryat or the Friedman is not that the reactive load fails or the reactive load in some way directly damages the amp due to a bad design. It's that um, it's, you've got a 100 watt Marshall and you've never played it on 10 because your ears would fall out of your skull. But then you have a reactive load, so you can play it on 10. So you do. And you don't know that your filter caps were on the verge of death, but you were coasting by because you were never put, asking that much from them. Then you ask that much from them, they, they fail, or a tube goes out, or whatever. So if you've been running uh, your car never going over fourth gear, and all of a sudden you go into sixth gear and you find out, oh, you had bad tires or had bad brakes, you might not have found that out if you'd never gone into that sixth gear. Uh, so uh, any reactive load can reveal or exacerbate a pre-existing problem in an amp, even if they're not causing that. So you may uh, blow a, you know, start blowing fuses if you use one, and it really turns out that you had a, a faulty EL34 that you never realized because you're never pushing it that hard before. But there are load boxes and 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 uh, such out there um, that reflect the wrong primary impedance back. Sorry, reflect the wrong secondary impedance back to the output transformer, and can cause big problems. Um, that's a big subject. But there there are bad ones, and I think the Waza probably is in that category. Now, boss, don't sue me. This is hearsay. It's reputable hearsay. Uh, but sometimes that's enough. Yeah, thank you everyone uh, for giving this thing a like if, if you if you get around to it. It does help me out. Um, it seems a, a silly thing to talk about. I forget to even click this little thing that I put up here. I spent all the time programming this stuff, even trying to make it funny uh, or funny-ish, funny-esque, funny adjacent for you guys. But uh, then I forget to do it. Uh, but I do appreciate you guys doing the likes. It does help me. It, it tells YouTube uh, people react to this and therefore they should tell more people that this thing exists and more people can find out about it. Oh, GA5, no, just, just stick a reverb pedal in front of it or record it and then add the reverb in post. Uh, that's, that's what I did to that basement on that video this morning. I just recorded the basement dry and slapped, uh, slapped uh, some reverb on in post and it sounded really good. Eric, I'm not sure what you're saying. The deluxe reverb is not the same map from the 60s though. It's the exact same circuit as far as the 65 reissue. Uh, not all the components are the same, but as I've shown, you can make the reissue an awful lot better uh, to the point where in that comparison of the 65, the 66, and the modified re uh, reissue, People were confusing um, the 65 and the uh, reissue. A lot of people form bad opinions of the 65 reissue series because they're hearing the C12K speaker, which is stock in most of those, and it is an abhorrent speaker. It sounds bad. It is an unpleasant thing. But... It doesn't matter how good the amp might be if the speaker is just crapping all over it. You can have the world's best amp and play it through a bad speaker. It's going to sound like a bad amp. Yeah, there's just nothing you can do about it. You have a world's worst amp, play it through the world's best speaker, then you're going to hear a really terrible amp very well. But, uh, you know, every, every chain has got a weak link. And in the 65s, the audible weak link is that speaker. Well, Chris, I've not had a Synergy module in place in front of me yet, or I've not tried one, but I know Bruce Agnator and I know Dave Friedman, and they're not going to put all that time and effort into something that sucks. They're just not. So you know, sometimes I'm just going to go based on knowing someone's past uh, accomplishments that their future accomplishments might be pretty good too. Uh, let's not talk about uh, uh, Elon Musk here, though. Yikes. Yeah, man, the prices on old fenders have gone up some crazy. Yeah, Shep, send me some pictures. I'll look for them. Um, 
and uh, and I'll be glad to talk to you. I, I like talking about amps. I like stuff like this. It's just I'm, I'm I've been crazy busy. I'm going through questions here. Hey again, John. Yeah, Fuchs casinos are really good. Um, I, I've known Andy for a while. He does really good work. He's on that same list with, with John and Dave and the, and the guys I mentioned before. Uh, the casino series, um, and, he's, and he's got a whole bunch of ODS variants as well. I would say, and I think he would say, that they are designed to be the next price tier down from Two Rock. Uh, but I don't think you're... I don't think there's any sacrifice involved. Um, their PCB versus turret and or eyelet rather, which is what Turok does. But you know, Nils Lofgren has used uh, a lot of Fuchs on stage with Bruce for an awful long time, and they tend to work every time. Uh, and he does good stuff. He's got a good shop. He's got a good team of guys working with him. Thanks all for the kind words, and especially on the basement. That, that's been a lot of fun. I look forward to you guys getting to hear it for real versus in the background. I just I have a perverse pleasure in saying, do you want to hear this app? You're soaking in it. You know, you've already been listening to it. I thought the reverb might throw people off a little bit. That was a, uh, a plate reverb preset for those who are wondering. And just one of the stock things built into uh, into uh, Da Vinci, not even one of the Logic ones. Let's see. All right, buddy, with an H, he's got a one fifteen combo. I thought you said so two. Oh, so you want to put a fifteen inch speaker in there, twenty two by twenty four by eleven deep. So not that deep uh, with a fifteen, man. I don't know that I would. Am I remembering correctly that this is the one you put a Fender Twin into? The Fender, um, I'm not sure that that'd be a, a great, great choice from my perspective. But um, and there's not a lot of not all as many choices for 15 inch speakers. So I, I think you're just going to try it. Let's see. Could I recommend a 12 inch speaker for a 1x12 open back cabinet that's 24 wide by 12 inches deep by 16 high? Okay, it's a little bit smaller uh, uh, height wise and a little bit deeper than a, a Deluxe Reaper using a 50 watt 2x2 by two by two ELF 34 preamp similar to 2204. Uh, yeah. Um, well, next question is what? sounds are you trying to get are you an Allman Brothers sound fan are you a Dokken fan are you a Van Halen fan are you a Zep fan or yes do you want something that gets kind of close to all those things um, I might be leaning towards the eminence governor for you but I would know more if I knew what your tastes are or the wizard Let's see. Well, thanks, NYC Geology. Um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, people don't understand the concept of a small sample size and how meaningful it is. There is no good Fender Supersonic. Every amp in that series is bad. Uh, uh, avoid all the Fender Supersonics. Uh, they're promising too much and delivering way too little, and they have the same uh, heat-related failure modes as the Hot Rods and, and Blues DeVilles. Oh, good Lord, I don't want to be called a guru, and I, I, I'm much too, much, much too big a fan of deodorant to go the other direction. 
Yeah, Super Twin. When you said Super Twin and you said 60s, I thought you meant a, a Vox. But um, yeah, yeah, the Super Twin reverbs, uh, the Fenders, those are late, late 70s. Uh, but send me the photos, I'll let you know. I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Hey, Bird Marble. Yeah, it's possible. Um, uh, you don't want to worry about calming the dwell down. You just want to change the tank. Uh, we'll get to the reverb second part. First, the question is, is it possible to modify the 65 Reissue Deluxe to turn tremolo on without a door switch, without a foot switch? I think is an autocorrect thing. And is there a reverb mod to ca calm the dwell down? As far as the tremolo, um, the Aside from the Princeton and the Vibro Champ, where the tremolo is always on unless you use a foot switch, all the other Fender tremolo circuits, you have to have tremolo plug inserted in order to have tremolo. Uh, and the way that on on the reissue, it's a quarter inch stereo jack. So the tip is the tremolo, the ring is the reverb. Easy to remember, T R. So all you need to do is get a stereo uh, jack. Uh, Oh, sorry, stereo plug, stereo quarter inch plug, and uh, connect the tip to the sleeve and don't connect anything to the ring and put it in the back of your amp and you'll have always on tremolo and always on reverb. You just use the front control knobs. Might cost you four or five bucks. Um, and, uh, you know, don't try to hold it while doing it or you'll, you'll cost yourself a few bandages as well because it'll get hot on the tip and the sleeve. Um, as far as the reverb, the tank in there is a long decay. It's a very long decay compared to the old ones. Uh, go find a medium or short decay tank with the same specs. Uh, I like the Mojo Tone medium decay tank for that. Uh, it, it does what you're trying to do without any permanent modification, and it's a higher quality tank. And it's only like 30 bucks. Shep, send me some pictures of your Super Twin, uh, including under the doghouse. I can let you know if it's safe to play or not. It's probably for just visually. Um, those are very heavy amps that I would not recommend shipping to me. Uh, you would pay hundreds in shipping, even just the chassis. But I could maybe find you someone local to you. Yeah, Lawlers are great, um, but all all P90s, all single coils, are subject to environmental noise. True single coils. Um, so it is what you the price you pay for tone. If your 65 Deluxe is popping on the standby switch, you've got a problem with that amp. And as I've said in many many videos. The IC brand or Lelon, sometimes the blue Lelons, uh, filter caps in those amps suck. And good news is brand new, good quality amps, uh, two, sorry, caps for that amp, about 25 bucks. Uh, and I've even shown how to do it on my channel, how to change those out. They're pretty easy to do in that little doghouse. Or if you have someone do it, if you just have that done, just have the, all the caps in the doghouse done, you might be able to find a, a tech to do that and just charge you one hour of labor plus a 25 to 50 bucks parts, depending on what he charges for those parts. Or, you know, if you get the F and T's, they cost more, but it's still not a lot of money in the long run. I might uh, get some, some uh, Mojotone PF clones in to try out. I've heard good things about them, Matt, and I know you, you like them a lot. But then again, you like that nasty uh, Dumble style uh, overdrive pedal, that silver thing. Sounded like ass. That's my that's my review. Sounds like ass. Matt Fields is wrong. I'm, I'm shitting you, man. I'm just getting, pulling your leg. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. That pedal sounded awful. But if you like it, hey, if it works for you, that's great.
Hey, uh, unless it's for a very rare and valuable amp, if you, you know, there are transformer companies, Mercury does it, a few others who can rewind one, um, their custom guys do, who can measure what it should be and rebuild it and repot it and all that stuff. In general, just buy something new. It's a very expensive uh, pro- prospect. And unless you're re- working on an old uh, Ampeg B15 or something like that where there's just nothing equivalent on the market today, just buy something equivalent. Yeah, Emmett, uh, send me an email. I'll look for it. We'll, we'll get you taken care of as I can uh, in a few months. It's the, it's the when that'll be the thing, but we'll talk about that. Yeah, send me some pictures, Shep. Hey, Anthony. Yeah, you got an SG standard. He loves the way it plays, but finds the bass, the tone so bassy and muddy. It's going to depend on a few things. Um, I don't know what year SG standard you have. A lot of Gibsons up to about five years ago all had 300K pots. 300K pots roll off tons of high end and you get muddy. And some of the SGs have got the uh, 489 pickups or 490, and those tend to be higher output uh very dark, boomy. Uh, the one I've got is a 61 standard, and it has um, a 61 version of a of a um, uh, bur- uh, what do they call it? Burst Bucker Pro, and they sound quite good. And then I've got the Memphis Historic Spec in the in 335. But um, I don't find the pickups in this SG to be boomy. Let me let you hear it. Too many guitars. Ah, and the rev star is on the cable. There we go. All right, so stock burst bucker 61 neck pickup, baseman, normal channel, treble and bass both at n- at noon. got 500k pots 500k tone pots and volume and it's very, sounds very nice if I were to go back there and turn the treble up just about six six and a half I think this would be perfect when you even need to touch the bright switch but you'll notice hopefully you'll, you'll be able to see the height of the neck pickup if you're any closer to the strings than that, you're going to get a lot of woofiness. And I've got the bass side slightly farther from the strings than the treble side. And that helps out a lot as well. All my floor stands are taken up, so let me put this back on the wall. All my guest guitar stands are in use. That's never happened before, all three at once. I have a wall hanger like you'd find in a guitar store for, for the usual suspects. Then I've got these little folding stands because when I'm doing playing tests, I, I don't want to have to reach up on the wall for things. So what I have going is always out. Or if someone comes over and they bring their guitar, maybe have three guitars going at once. There it is. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not just... Gibson pickups are not crappy, but some of them are. It's not a fact of humbuckers, but a lot of older Gibsons, you know, they use crappy, crappy uh, pots, 300Ks. 500K makes a big difference. Do a rocker verb mark three. Those can be a very bassy amp, but, uh, you know, play around with knob settings. There's no rule saying you have to have your bass over two. 
Whatever works, whatever gets the sound. You know, doc, doc, it hurts when I do this. Let's see. All right, I'm up to the intermission. Yeah, that intermission thing, that's high class. The guacamole, Gretsch. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I figured if I didn't just say, if I didn't put out something that says intermission and someone tunes in and, to this live stream and it's just an empty chair surrounded by stuff, they're like, what the hell channel is this? But occasionally I need coffee or I need to pee, so intermission's a good thing. Red plate amps, my thoughts on red plate amps. I, um, I had one come in. I'm trying to remember... It was built an awful lot like a two rock, you know, a good Dumble copy in that case. It had some stupid mistake in it. Uh, something like, I don't remember whether it was like a 470K where a 470 ohm should have been or vice versa, or 82K versus 82 or eight versus 820 ohms, something like that. Um, I don't, I, I don't remember. And I'm not saying that the company makes bad mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes once in a while. And I might have found the only one out of thousands with a problem. But I remember thinking, hmm, I think for this price point, the QC should have been there. That should have been caught. Because it's it's one thing to say it passes signal. It's another thing to say that sounds right. And it did not sound right. And it did not sound right from day one. But the fix was about... 15 minutes of looking around and, and listening and measuring and, and then changing out one little thing. It was an important little thing, but it was just one little thing. Let's see. <laughs> Richard Clark wins the comment of the week. I don't think Mike Campbell wants to be dusted off. I'm pretty sure he likes it that way. I just, whenever I... Think of, think of big old Gretches and the and the and the, uh, the Bigsby. I think of the the um, what's that cool video? Down 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 down. We're all in the like post apocalyptic desert, and he's just out there in like an old dusty coat and with that Gretch and just sun, and cool sunglasses. It's kind of like a Mad Max vibe. Uh, and, and he does a solo in the video and he hits that Gretsch and the, and the camera angles. That came out when I was like 12, so that was a big impact. I could sing that song, which I'll spare you, but I can't remember the, the title of it right now. People are probably screaming at me in the comments right now. Yeah, they're, 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 they're fine, man. Um, you can get very Marshall-esque sounds out of that at that amp. Um, the Marshall channel, the basement channel, and the top boost channel are kind of kissing cousins. They have differences, but the structure is very similar. If you if you look at the schematic and you squint, they're the same thing, just slightly different different implementations. Um, here's the thing: you may hear that and think, "Well, it doesn't sound quite like the Marshall." The average person in your audience is going to say, that sounds great. They're going to say, well, that doesn't actually, that sounds more like a 74 than a 78. And uh, by uh, mid-78, they changed to this capacitor type, and I can clearly hear the silky velvet tones. You know, there's so much talked about online because it's faster to talk than, it, than to practice. Thanks, Shep. appreciate that. Hey, uh, Nikon, I think RJ is absolutely correct about that. I use them as much as possible on old amps, and I'll use them sparingly but surgically in new designs. For one of the problems right now is that a lot of the manufacturers who've been making carbon comp compositions uh, have stopped, and the supply is about to uh, be severely affected. It already has. Uh, Mauser has got like 41 left in stock total, and digit key much the same. They're out of production from some of the brands that are making the best ones. And I'm going to be buying hundreds of them just to tie me over so that, you know, that's when I restore these fenders, I want to put the original carbon comps in. 
the day will come when it'll start being a mixture of carbon comps and carbon films, and eventually it'll just be carbon films, uh, except for those who are willing to pay for me to buy a whole bunch of uh, new old stock stuff off of uh, you know ham site, ham radio sites, and and eBay and stuff, and finding ones which still measure okay because that gets really expensive, but. Until about six months ago, I could still buy brand new ones that were fantastic for certain purposes. So RG is right, but it's they don't they don't magically make an app better. But uh, everything in an amplifier is the entire design, how things work together, and little incremental changes which cumulatively uh, end up in a with a specific uh, flavor. Well, Chris, if if you had eight and sixteen in parallel, you'd have uh, about uh, six ohms. If you had them in series, you'd have uh, twenty-four ohms. <coughs> Don't read too much into what I'm about to say, but when we talk about sixteen ohms or eight ohms, that is at a given frequency, typically at one k. Freq- speakers are different. Uh, have different impedances at different frequencies. F- to make it easier to understand, we've all decided to say it's a 16 ohm, it's an 8 ohm, and they're measuring at 1K. But at 400 hertz, at 12, 12K, at 30 hertz, they're going to have different impedances. So if you have a slight mismatch, it's okay. 6 to 8, you're not going to hear any difference. The behavior is not going to change that much. 4 to 8, it's not going to be that huge a deal. It's about 3 dB drop and the, the tone will change more or less depending on the um, uh, speakers used. So EL84s are more affected by that than 6V6s are. If you do a, a what we call a, a two-step mismatch, 4 to 16 or vice versa, that's when you have problems. That can be just way too much. Thanks, Michael P- Padilla. No, the uh, reverb is is fine in the head on the Voxes because he's at, he's he's getting thinking about getting an AC15 C1 head head. That's actually the AC15 CH for use as backup. Uh, it's, it's not a problem because the reverb is physically very far for a head uh, from the transformers. No problems with the pickup in my experience at all. And the uh, the head version of that app actually has an attenuator built into it, which is pretty good. So, yeah, I recommend it. And thank you very much for the super chat. Hello again, Mr. Hal. We were just talking about you not too long ago. Yeah, Hal came over this morning to drop off that Gretsch. And uh, he, he took the, the uh, Revstar for a spin. And without me saying anything about what was up with the wiring, and he's like, yeah, these are good. And the rest of that is too honky and muffled. I don't like that. So he agreed totally with my opinion of those fancy uh, selector switches. And he was playing all those things, of course, through that 67 uh, baseman. And he sounded really good doing that. And so we're going to invite him back when the thing is done and let him show you how he would approach using that on a gig. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. No, I've not had any experience with the, the seriotone. Sorry. Cheriotone lunchboxes. I'm not making fun of the company. Just every time I say seriotone, someone's like, it's pronounced cheriotone. Well, then they should have spelled it cheriotone because it's spelled seriotone. I say that mockingly. Um, I also get people on my videos saying, it's not, it's not solder, it's solder. Solder. You should be soldering everything. Don't you know what the solder is? I have, a, I have a very strong suggestion for where they can stick their solder with the aluminum and the lifts and the lorries. But uh, I love, I love, I love everyone, everywhere. I have nothing but love for, for England and the culture. And I, I find it the source of most of my comedy. Um, uh, um, but I am aware as an American that there are different pronunciations and even spellings for things on various sides of the ponds. And I don't think it's too much for the Brits to understand the same thing. So that rather than correcting me on how to pronounce a word, 
you are actually showing that you are ignorant. Um, we actually pronounce it based on it, how it came from the French. In this case, with your solder, you are deliberately, as the Brits love to do, mangling French. So you're in, deliberately mangling French, and we are uh, inheriting uh, a pronunciation from the French. And I'm going to say solder just to piss you guys off. What you going to do about it? Want your free back? Hey, PF. I'm glad that the, uh, he watched the videos on about uh, ground locations on a 2204. He said it worked perfectly. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm glad. That's why I put that stuff out there. Replacement battle, baffle on a 72 Super, Baltic Birch. Thanks for the continued content. Uh, yeah, Baltic Birch or Marine Grade ply, something that's void free, very high quality. Before you make one, though, unless you have a workshop and it's just no big deal at all for you to set all this stuff up. Mojo Tone has very good baffles, uh, um, really high quality baffles at pretty reasonable prices that fit most production Fender amps. I think that their Super Reverb one does fit on a 72. The only issue with the 72 is if it has the dado glued in baffle rather than the cleats, either way you go, you're gonna need to flush cut out the old baffle and then install cleats so you can put in a new screw and baffle. So for most people, the Mojo Tone pre-existing baffle with or without grill cloth is going to be more cost effective than making one. And there's a whole lot less work involved. But with any 72 and later Fender, um, you, unless you're set up to do so, it, it can be hard to flush cut out the old baffle. Um, make sure that you really need to. Sometimes the old baffle is okay and it's just the screws that are loose, in which case a tech can... If you don't mind replacing your grill cloth, a tech can uh, replace the old uh, inset reverse screws with some T-nuts or something. Wrong button, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, Gary Thor uh, Thornstenson, any thoughts on projector style guitar amps? Yeah, the Filmosonics, Filmosounds, whatever. They're garbage. Uh, just avoid it. It's, it's it's a cutesy thing. Look, I made I made an amplifier out of this old projector. Look, I made a lamp out of this guitar. Look, I made a guitar out of this lamp. Uh, it's cost much more to do that than it would be just to build a five e three from scratch. Most of people doing the Filmos sound are ending up somewhere along the lines of a five e three based on the transformers and the tubes that are available. You know the options. It's just an awful lot of work to have something that's kind of cute. Uh, and there are better ways to, to build an, a better app. I know that's not very popular, but. Hey, Brett. Yeah. Um, the other day we talked about what's wrong with the old Fender Tone Master Head and Vibro King. Brett um, brought in those two Dr. Z Root 66s. But didn't get in what to make the old ProSonic better. Could you get into that a bit? Well, the ProSonic does not have uh, really cheap alpha uh, dual 500K potentiometers linear taper uh, for every pot in the app. Uh, the ProSonic does not have about an extra six yards of ground wires going everywhere, seemingly randomly. Terrible ground loops, really strangely heavy-duty construction on things that don't need it, which just make it difficult to fix, and peanuts mismatches everywhere. I think the uh, I think the ProSonic was an inherited design of, of um, um, Paul Rivera's, which was continued on, whereas the Tone Master and, and Vibro King were um, what's-his-nuts, Zinke's brilliant ideas. And so those those Zinke ones are just absolutely overpriced garbage piles of shit. The Pro Sonic is a pretty good sounding app with a couple of flaws. Uh, it had a, a split plate uh, reverb driver, right? Was I can't remember if it's the driver or the recovery stage on the reverb. Uh, but I think it's recovery stage with a split plate set up very odd with an additional gain stage, and it's just noisy. But they they released a factory fix. If you do that and you recap the amp. And you clean up the board with some de with some um, desoldering. Uh, I can't talk today, Jesus Christ. With some isopropyl, it's a good sounding app. It's got an interesting sounding overdrive. I think it sounds 
really competitive with a lot of maces from that same era. Paul Rivera is a very good designer. The, uh, the Rivera era fenders have a mixed reputation, some deservedly so, because his, des- his ideas were not always implemented by the factory well. But the ProSonic, I think, I think came closest of the ones I've tried, so certainly more than the Concert 2s and stuff. But the, the ProSonic is, is a good app once you denoise the reverb. And they were nice enough to put a service bulletin out showing how everyone how to do that. I think it's like three or four resistors and a capacitor you change, two capacitors. So I still don't know why they did all the complicated stuff when they could have just said, here's the AB763 stuff with a little more gain. Bell 9440, I do not know a good tech in Knoxville, sorry. Knoxville's like seven hours away from Memphis. We're the same state, but it's it's like San Diego and and Berkeley, you know. We don't run into each other very often. Hey, Yanuv from Israel. That's cool. We don't I'd like to get more people from all over the world. We've been very heavy on Australia and Europe, and I'm sure um, both time zones and the channel being in English are a big part of that. But I welcome everyone from Africa, the Middle East, uh, uh, Eastern Asia, Southern Asia, everywhere. Please, if you like music, you like guitar, you like amps, join us. Um, and if your English is not great, I'm not afraid to use Google Translate and uh, no judgment. Uh, Jan, if I'm not saying your English is not great, uh, many, many people in Israel speak fluent English as a native, obviously. Um, uh, but I'm just saying to the world, I don't ever mean for this to be exclusive, exclusive place. And Mazel Tov, Yanif. Shalom. I don't mean that in the cutesy way. Uh, I mean, I mean it sincerely. Shalom. Hey, Tristan Schmuckley. Is that your real name, Schmuckley? With a name like Schmuckley's, it's got to be. Um, anyway, uh, I, I used a Hacko 936 for a long time. I used one, uh, a previous model before that. Now I've got a FX951, which is a glorious thing. Um, but um, uh, any 80, $80 or $90 up Hacko is going to do a wonderful job for you. Hey, Jim B., I don't know someone in Akron, but I know someone in Columbus. Uh, um, but I can't remember his name right now. I'm sorry. Uh, I have things where I, I, I have the ability to look it up, uh, but not in the middle of a live, live stream. Um, Brad will go off and research all kinds of stuff in the middle of his streams and pull up schematics, but uh, I try to move on. Um, can't remember the guy's name. I know someone in Columbus, which is not too far. Uh, I'll try to find it and put it in the comments of this afterwards. Good, and I was wondering if anyone was going to pick up on that. Yeah, pulling off Scotty Moore. Uh, thank you for thank you for going there, old friend. Let's see. I'm scrolling down. One of the problems with doing this from my perspective is it takes me a long time to get to everyone's questions. So while people are waiting, they start talking to each other, which is wonderful. It's, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the main attraction here. I want the, everyone to talk to each other. Um, but I, I'm trying to weed through to get stuff that needs to make it on, on the screen, etc. And so it slows me down. So talk amongst yourselves. Hey, Rico. Uh, thank you very much. After the power transformer of my Tweed Deluxe clone was replaced, it seems to me the amp is louder, hotter, feels stiffer, and the volume knobs are barely usable. Is this possible? Well, let's put the uh, volume knobs to the side. Uh, the power transformer, if it was replaced with the incorrect power transformer, with the voltages are wrong, 
the entire volt, everything in the amp could change, um, and you could be terribly misbiased. Uh, output tubes may not be working properly. Uh, the uh, volume knob is barely usable and indicate to me that something is amiss with the ground schemes in your amp. Um, the volume behavior should not change with a power transformer unless you were to say have a bad ground or uh, blow a, a filter cap. But something sounds unhealthy in your amp and I think you should find a tech to look at it because it's much, what you're describing could lead to things that involve sm fire and smoke and big damage. So if, if I'm wrong, you get peace of mind. If I'm right, you save your, your investment by getting it looked at. And any tech who has that on their bench not only can say this is what's happening and here's either how we adjust it or what we need to do, they can also sort out the volume thing for you. But that's not a behavior that power transformers should be causing. Let's see. Scrolling down. At least I've learned to stop doing this. I see, I see, I see past chats where I'm scrolling. I'm going to scroll. Really sexy. I, I, in fact, I have a note on the screen. It says, keep your damn mouth closed. Hey, yeah, he's having a hard time finding Freeman and Sir locally. He can get Victoria. Are they any good? Yeah, they're good. They're not, I I mean, no disrespect to Victoria. I don't think that they're in the same league as Freeman or Sir or Germino, but they're quite good. Uh, I have not had all their models, and the ones I've had in have just been straight Fender clones, and they are good Fender clones with excellent construction, and they're fine. Um uh, I've not think I've not found that there was anything innovative there. But if there's a market and they feel a need, that's fine. I would say that in general, Victorious and the fenders they're derived from sound very different than the Freedmans. Sir has got models that cross over, you know. Um, but aside from the Bella, I'm not sure if too many Sirs do any have any overlap with uh, most Victorias. Uh, I guess not really even that. The bell is more of a si later 60s kind of thing. Um, uh, a, a Sir Amp that people don't talk about much is the Badger. That's a really nice one. We don't need those stinking Badgers, but uh, uh, I'll stop there. Uh, it's a nice kind of Vox Marshall E thing. Oh, Visage P. Uh, don't wait because I've been trying to get to it since for the last year. Every time I get start to get the research for that video, prices change, or availability of X or Y or Z changes. So um, I want to get it done. I, I mean, if I was just trying to grow the channel rather than a, being an actual app repair restoration designer business, if, if my focus was YouTube, I would have done that channel. I've done that video a year ago, and I've. Because uh, those things bring me in over 100,000 views. Those are by far the most popular money-making videos on the channel. But I, 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 my primary goal is, you know, responsibility is to the clients to get the apps done. And I've not had the time to, to do the uh, next video. And the, the market has been changing crazily in the last two years. So I will. I will. But I don't. Uh, if you have a question about buying an app, ask in here. And even if, if I don't answer it, odds are someone else will. Um, you don't have to wait for a video. Tristan, I do not have any opinions on the new JC120s, but uh, they are not, they never have been good. I can't imagine them suddenly getting better. Um, uh, I mean, th th they were great in 1978. 1978, the world changed. That thing with the chorus and everything was phenomenal. There's, you know, there's a very outdated trick now. They're, they have no headroom. They're very noisy for what they are. The chorus doesn't have any real controls. You can get the same result with the, with the Boss Katana for a lot less money, and then you can have all these other sounds. I, I, I just don't, I don't see the appeal of that. 
Hey, Dave. I'm saying hello to him after he's been here probably an hour because <laughs> I'm so far behind. Yeah, I'm, I'm about 30 minutes behind where the chat is. But hey, Dave. Let's see. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. It's like Ted uh, Woodford. And we're polishing, polishing, polishing. Oh, Keith Sharp, you got a solid state Vox Thomas organ app. It plays fine until he turns it up, starts cutting out, and the ideas. Uh, uh, man, those, those things were built with transistors that haven't been made since like 1970. And it wasn't like there was this model of transistor. It was just a germanium transistor, and they'd, they'd measure and find which ones had X, Y, or Z gain and paint them blue or red or yellow or green to sort out the gain so they could build them. And those things, uh, that was a very short-lived part of technology where the world used germanium transistors. I mean, it got us to the moon, but it was abandoned shortly after because silicon was so much more reliable. And... Uh, Transistors became miniaturized, and so it was a very small window where the world used germanium transistors, and uh, they're really hard to find these days. They're really hard to replicate with any modern uh, 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 silicone stuff, or you know, I've seen people use combinations of germanium diodes and shock keys to make make ger uh, germanium transistors, and but it's, it's not like you needed a one in 914, you know, this is just a germanium, and hey, this had a, a gain factor of 70 versus a gain factor of 100. It's really hard to know. And if one of those things is misbiasing, it sounds like yours might be misbiasing when you push it. It could just be a resistor, but it could be a transistor that's going into cutoff at certain points. Without your amp in front of me, I can't tell you for sure. Um, there are guys who, who are older than I am who have more experience with that era of transistor. Uh, I think they might be better bets, and some of that stuff, once it, it dies, it can be a lot more expensive than it's worth to keep going, unless there's just been a huge bump in price of that old stuff, because I had a Super Beetle that turned into a three-year nightmare, and it was never really fixable. Uh, you know, I think there's some uh, Rickenbackers, at the same, Rickenbackers at the same time that use some similar uh, questionable transistor stuff. See, Emmett Otter, it's a it's a spider bite. I'm still waiting for my superpowers. Turns out, spider bites just hurt. Matt Field says, I don't like a lot of crap on here. I find myself biting my tongue a lot and just moving on. I mean, on the internet or on my live streams, you, you, don't, like, you don't like my crap, Matt? You don't like my crap? <laughs> uh, I am not a Canadian, Scott, but I know some, and I would imagine the best place to get tubes from in Canada, I'm not saying it's the best, but a good place is the tube store. Uh, I've been getting many things from the tube store for many years. They seem to be good people with a good selection. Though COVID hit them very hard, they are still around. Dave might have some other ideas on that too. Yeah, the spider amps do suck. I <laughs> mean, yeah. Mm. Scrolling down, trying to maybe catch up a little bit with you guys. People talking about PRS guitars and compressors now.
Huh, let's see. We've been going two and a half hours. I'm going to do one more cuz I need I need to I need to see a man about a dog. I'm going to come back to your question, Donald. We're going to do another intermission. I know I usually go at the top of an hour. Uh but I I I I I uh I missed one. So we're going to go back to an intermission. We'll see you guys in 7 minutes.
Uh, interrupted the intermission. I uh, went a little bit longer between intermissions this time than usual because I got I lost track of time. Then my bladder is like. So I think we'll go another maybe 20, 30 minutes. We usually do about three hours on Saturday, more or less, depending on the, you know the t- fourteen minutes worth of intermissions. All right, let's get back to the question on bias. This is a really big question, and the real answer is chapter length. But the bias controls how much. Let's let's sit, grossly simplify. So if anyone feels like, well, actually, just sit on your hands. A bias tells the tube how much to amplify, and uh, think of it like a car, uh, tuning your car. You can tune a car to have really great gas mileage, or you can tune a car to be have great acceleration and a lot of torque for, for going really fast. It's hard to get it tuned to do both. And you want to find a, a uh, you want to set the bias so the tube is operating kind of for the, as much of the best of both worlds as you can. If you set the bias too hot, the tube won't last very long, and it won't sound very good in one way. If you set the bias too cold, the tube will last a really long time, but it'll never sound that great. Mesa, Mesa. So th- we're talking output tubes. All preamp tubes, 99.999% of all preamp tubes you'll ever encounter are also cathode biased, but we don't talk about that very much. Uh, we talk about the bias in the output section a lot because that's more critical because there's more current, and it... Uh, that's a that's a variable which is often available to the owner with a trim pot that needs to be adjusted. Hopefully, every time you change power tubes, output tubes, um, it's not always the case, and it's not always necessary. But it's always a good idea to be mindful of it, and maybe to do, do that. If you have a cathode biased amp, you do not need to change the bias every time or have the amp biased every time you change output power tubes. Uh, you do need often, um, especially with an older cathode bias amp, to have a tech make sure that the bias is set correctly for modern wall voltages, after which is more or less set and forget. Uh, beyond that, it gets really complicated and there are a lot of what about this is, and you really need to, to uh, uh, read chapters uh, on this, but yeah, Nikon built Micon there with sets the idle RPM of the app. Hey, I didn't even read that. He went to the same analogy I did. Other people are also answering the question. Let's see. Does volume on 10 and master on 2 put extra load on filter caps? No, no. Uh, almost nothing you can do in the preamp t- section is going to affect um, the, uh, the filter caps. Um, and in a healthy, well-designed app, um, the, the load on the filter caps is not going to change that much even with the master cranked and the amp cranked, you know, it's, um, it gets complicated. But uh, an amp that's well-designed can be played loud for long periods of time. The trouble is you get an amp that was well-designed but hasn't had full, what I call generational maintenance. When you see an offender come in or Marshall come in and I totally recap it, all the electrolytics are changed, all the DC's out, that's a generational service. And sadly, it doesn't happen every generation, every 20 years. So when it builds up, then things can fail. Um, and most repair, if that's done every 20 years and done correctly, and I'm, I'm not the only one who can do it correctly, then you don't have to do that drastic a service every every couple of years. It may be like, okay, uh, change tubes, revise it. Okay, I spilled a Coke, can you clean that up before it catches on fire? Um, amps are not coasters, but... Um, I see a lot of mythology on the uh, various forums because people are working with amps that are not, in fact, have not been serviced, are not working as designed, 
And, um, you know, people think that vintage amps are noisy, vintage amps hum, vintage amp hisses. No, no. Old, poorly maintained amps will. A 66 Super Reverb maintained is going to be one of the quietest, quietest, lowest noise, best sounding amps you've ever heard in your life. It's just that not that many people get to experience a 66 Super Reverb in that condition these days. Hey, Simon. Yeah, Simon, I, I've enjoyed the stuff you've done there with, with Jason Tong. Um, yeah, um, I saw I saw you guys going through the Waza and, and, and talking about blowing uh, fuses when you switch the, the reactive s s uh, load while, while playing. I've, I've just heard from other techs that the Waza uh, does not always present the best impedance to the uh, output transformer. Or, um, it gets complicated. I think Brad's about to do a big video on that subject, um, which I think uh, would be great to share with people. And if, if Dave's still here, Dave's going to have more experience than I do on this because you know uh, Dave is dealing with a lot of players who are dealing with reactive loads and dummy loads and, and silent stages. And I'm getting guys who want to be able to use their, their deluxe reverb and not get told to turn down. So we have a different clientele. If I were in LA, I'd have a lot more experience with this kind of fun stuff as well. Um, so uh, if, if a client came to me and said, I need a reactive load, I would call Dave. I would call John Sura and say, what, what, should, what are the best options for this guy? Uh, always, I, I, I never pretend to know everything. And I'm always glad to phone a friend, um, so to speak. Um, I, I like the sounds that you you, you guys got in that uh, twelve different tones with the uh, with the Alta video, Simon. It was a really good good and looked like a fun process. Um, it was a good video, and I was impressed by some of the sounds you got from the Waza. I just would have concerns recommending that unit to people, and if I'm wrong, that's great. And like I said, boss, don't sue me. I have no money. I'm, pardon me. I'm skipping some stuff, trying to get caught up. Uh, but I'm going to get the ones that I think only I can answer or don't get talked about. Or in this case, where the forums will lead you mis wrong, don't make any changes to an AC4C1. It's not a very good amp. It was never going to be a good amp. You cannot make it a good amp. A choke will be a total waste of money and not solve any of the actual problems the amp has. Uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of the AC15 and AC30 C series. The f 4 and the 10 are horrible, horrible products. Um, that if someone said, hey, Dave, you know, Friedman, if he's still here, what do you think about this? He'd be like, get out of here with that. That car. I can't give my, my, my clients that bullshit. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marketing thing. It's a thing, hey, we need someone on the market at this price range. Uh, the, uh, the, mar the focus group says we, it needs to have these features and needs to look like an old Vox. Here you go. It's, it's bad. I'd, I'd, Boss Katana every day will kill that thing and last longer. Some of the questions I'm not answering, I've, I've seen that they've already been well answered here, like where to get capacitors. Uh, Wiley C. Coyote is asking Nikon Man what speaker for 65 reissue. Um, there's been some, I've done some comparison videos showing uh, the same deluxe reverb, some 65 reissue, some originals with different speakers. Um, it's a personal choice. Almost anything except the C12K or the uh, Cannabis Rex, unless it's something that doesn't have enough wattage. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with R.G. Keene's uh, articles on carbon comps, and I think he's absolutely correct. And I have followed uh, his articles by experimenting with them. And it is audible, but it's it's kind of thing where it's not like you change one resistor and you hear a transformation of the app. It has to be this changes and this changes and this changes, cumulative things. Otherwise, you know, our oral memory is not good. You know, by the time you've changed a component, your 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 memory of something has has gone off. I mean, put it this way: everyone right now watching this, 
turn off any music you're listening to. Remember a song. Remember one of your favorite songs off one of your favorite records. You got it? You hear it in your head? You're hearing it in mono. Ah, you just remembered a stereo event in the song. You went and searched out what that felt like to hear that stereo aspect of that recording. But when you first recall that song, you're not hearing it in mono. Your brain, our brains process sight far, give sight far more priority than we, our brains and memory give hearing. So we kind of, we kind of have shortcuts in our brains. We're hardwired that way. We remember exactly what someone, something looks like. We remember what exactly what something sounds like much less accurately unless we intentionally try to. So you can intentionally remember uh, that panning thing that happened on Axe as Bold as Love if you're trying to remember that. But if you just hear Little Wing in your head, odds are, unless you're some freak musical phenom, your memory's in mono. That's just one example. No one's audio memory is to be trusted. That's why when you do this thing, you have to do double blind, multiple sample tests of this kind of stuff. And I've done that with Carbon Comp. I've done that with ceramic versus film. I've done that over and over to the point where I'm very confident that yes, in certain cir circuits, in certain places of certain circuits, certain value of materials, whether it's a resistor or a capacitor, does make a subtle difference. And in conjunction with other things, I've had amps I've built where almost everything in there was on a three-way switch or more. That's crazy. I, this before I started the YouTube channel. I, uh, otherwise, I'd probably get a million hits. Maybe I need to build another one just for that. I even built amps where I'm switching between uh, uh, chokes and 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 uh, and, uh, and resistors while changing filtering cap filtering values at the same time. All this stuff matters. But that's, I would say, that's level C of a design. Level A of a design is grounding. Level B of a, of a, of a design is gain staging. Uh, and level C is this kind of subtle control over things. I could build you a great amp, the same great amp with carbon film, carbon comp, carb, uh, metal film, metal oxide, four different versions of the exact same amp, and you would hear certain differences. But we, we know which differences are due to the material versus which differences are, different, are due to different tolerances or different tubes or different speakers or the humidity changed or you just, your memory is short, your short term memory sucks. So it, it's, a, it's a deep, deep subject. Hey, David O'Shaughnessy, I uh, appreciate that. What, what's your budget? Uh, he says, uh, what amp would you recommend for Marshall Cleans and dirt for home use? It's going to depend on your your budget and your what your acceptable volume level is for home use. For some guys, I'm going to say go get a 50-watt Marshall. Some guys, I'm going to say go get a, a Freeman uh, Runt 20 or Dirty Shirley or whatever. Some guys, I'm going to say go get a Boss Katana. Some guys, I'm going to say, you know, that's, that's all fine and good. Just go get a Line 6 HG Stomp and some headphones. It's going to depend to a large degree on your budget and what your actual volume uh, requirements slash limitations are. Yeah, Nikon mic on the C12Q is very different than the C12K. C12Q is a good sounding speaker once it breaks in. It's way bright the first six weeks, six months, depending on how often you play it and how hard it gets better. Um, Anthony Mazzucetta, I've had some bad experiences with Bad Cat amps, but Bad Cat has had different periods under different ownerships. Pardon me. Not coffee, and it gives different results, especially when drinking quickly. Um, because I'm drinking it as if it's Coke. I'm forgetting about it. Um, so I, I don't know that all eras of bad cats are equally problematic, but bad cats and matchless, I find to be extremely overvalued in the market for what you get. I find, I find drastic design failures in both, uh, 
quality issues in both. Um, I think if you want something along that vibe, the uh, the stuff that um, Top Hat is putting out, I, f- I find much better built, much better sounding. Uh, some of it's subjective. Better sounding is subjective. Better built is not. Uh, catching on fire is not. Melting boards is not. I... I I think uh, in 1987, when Matchless came out, and Bad Cat's an offshoot of that, compared to what Fender and Marshall were putting out in 87, uh, Matchless was amazing. Just staggeringly good. In 2023, they're okay. Yeah, you know, they're, they're good. You can get some really good sounds out of them while they work. And some of them work better than others. depends on uh, how much they, they uh, uh, read the data sheet or not. Um, but... Um, yeah, I think there are better options, and I would. I think Top Hat sounds better than Matchless or uh, Bad Cat. Burnsy fifty five. All right, the real chicken, the egg question. Uh, if I were doing it, that if I well, if I were, I do this all the time. Here's what I do: I put. I use a, a ground lug, which has teeth on it. So I will do on the outside the screw and then a compression washer, not a toothed washer, a compression washer, then the chassis. Then on the inside, I will do the ground lug, which is toothed. And then I'll usually just do a nylock nut. If I needed to do a Keps nut versus a nylock nut, I would use a flat washer and then a Keps nut. So from the outside in, screw head, compression washer, chassis, toothed ground lug, and then either a flat washer followed by a Keps nut or a, uh, rather than the flat washer and Keps nut, I would just use a nylock nut. And that is uh, more than sufficient when properly done for everything. Now, if you're doing a commercially uh, produced app, and you're using an IEC connector, there is a specific sequence of hardware that code says you must use for the green or green and yellow striped ground. And I think that it is pretty much the same as what I just outlined uh, with the flat washer and the Keps nut or the or just using the um, uh, tooth washer, I'm sorry, the nylock nut, but they may insist on the washer as well. I don't, rec- the flat washer as well, I don't recall. I do love the ET65 Wes. I also love the uh, Celestion Creamback 65. I love a lot of speakers, but um, um, for most of my clients, the warehouse so- costs less and sounds as, as good, um, slightly different, but as good as the Celestion Creamback. So, I mean, not all my clients are rich. Um, and when I do a generational restoration on an app, and I'm like, hey, and, and your speaker's toast. That's a sad, depressing thing from them to hear. But if I say, hey, man, I can get you this warehouse thing, and my, my, my cost on this is a lot less than list, it's, it's a great thing I can do for them. I'm not using the warehouse because, just because it costs less or I get a good price on it. I would use it if it costs the same as a selection. It would just be another really good option. But especially on a 2x12, do you want to get $200 speakers or two? $180 speakers. That's a that's a big price difference for a subtle audible change. For other guys, they prefer the selection. I'm happy to put the selection in. Yeah, the, the, the Jupiter stuff that WGS w- makes, Matt, it's, it's just really great. And, and uh, Wes is thinking about getting one for his... Uh, 66 uh, to save the old Jensen. I think you would find um, if you have a deluxe reverb with a Jensen, is that what it is, Wes? I'm going to add this to the, to the screen. If you have the original Jensen, if it's a C12N, uh, don't get the ET65. If you want it to sound original, get, I mean, the ET65 is a great sound for that, but the um, G12C sounds an awful lot like a good condition C12N, if that's what your original Jensen was. Uh, both sound better than an Oxford, in my opinion. But the, the C12N is a fantastic speaker. 
But, you know, uh, the, the other thing is to recone your 66 if it's a C12N, it's like $80 to my guy. So if you ever need that done. But if you just want to preserve it, put it in a box. The G12C sounds an awful lot like the, the original Jensen if it's in good shape. The, ETC, the way I explain it to clients is if, you're, if your ideal fender clean is Stevie Ray, think Riviera Paradise, or Little Wing, you're probably going to like the G12C. If your ideal fender clean so, uh, tone is more of a Robin Ford thing, then the ET65 does it. Mm, you know, it's... It's always dancing about architecture to a degree. Hey, Sergio. Uh, yeah, the, the JCM2000 DSL 401 combo is entirely, entirely a different app than the DSL 40C. So um, I would avoid any JCM 2000s these days, even the ones that didn't have severe bias drift and other leakage issues. They're 30 years old at this point. Uh, the new DSL CR, DSL, sorry, 40 CR, 40 C, and 100 H are good amps. They're not phenomenal, but they're very good. The DSL 20 is not good. Uh, the old JCM 2000s, unless that is just your sound and you have to have that sound, in which case you're willing to pay 400 plus to have them made playable, uh, I think that, that let them go. Just let them go. There are other things out there. For the price of buying a JCM 2000 and then getting a guy like me to make it not catch on fire, you could buy something really good from Friedman. Let's see. Yeah, Dave L. I've have had the two channel H and the two and the two channel C. Uh, it's it doesn't sound great because it was designed to sound bad, and it is not the hands that wired it are not the hands that I would hire. It is not well made. See my two channel C video. They're very very similar amps. They're pretty much the same board, populated slightly differently. Uh, really bad quality PCBs masquerading as eyelet boards, really thin pads, uh, criminally, stupidly underrated diodes. Why would you use one in, I don't remember if they're 9148s or not, whatever, but versus a 4007, you're saving like half a penny per amp. Uh, just all kinds of, of stuff that makes no sense. And just, it's, and the, the core, uh, concept of how the circuit works is a bad one. I've made it one sound good. I won't do it again because at the end of the day, I've made an amp sound really good and it says PRS on the front. So, All right, Matt Fields is now just now reacting to my making fun of his overrated special. Uh, oh, he's not using the gain on it. Okay, so he agrees the gain on that thing sucks. Uh, uh, we're, I'm going to start wrapping this up. I'm going to get through as many as I can. MS uh, uh, Po Boy 1, I have no idea on your uh, uh, airline. I'd have to have it in front of me. But those things, you know, 62 airlines, were, those things were never expected to be played again in, in 60, 70 years from, now, from when they were made. They were kind of cheap, disposable commodities. Um, you know, it could be something very simple. It could be something very expensive. I'm not sure why, uh, why people seek them out so much. Oh man, Nikon, Micon, Dumbles are, are just amps. Everyone, everyone mythologizes them. They're good amps. They're just good amps. Um, uh, it's the right hands. The right hands are going to sound good with any of the amps from that period. Um, I, I'm not. I, I I can appreciate what's good about Dumble without worshiping at the church. By and large, they're they're modified. You know, like the ODS. It's, it started off as a modified baseman, like this AB165 here. Then he, you know, he just changed the structure a little bit and added a tone stack. Started with a fixed tone stack, then added 
a, a secondary tone stack, internally adjustable and all that fun stuff. And, uh, you know, I played around a lot with local negative feedback, local feedback. There's, there's no magic to it except the goop. No one quite knows how he made this blue goop, though I assume Papa Smurf was consulted at some point. All right, I'm trying to kind of get to the end here. If everyone can hold off on, on questions. We're just, people are talking about humbuckers. I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions today. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I, I really appreciate everyone joining today. And now people talk about aluminum. I have to go back and read all these comments later. I, en I enjoy this, but uh, I, I'm just... All right, here's something. I just scrolled to something that's important. All right, from, from Dave Friedman. The Waza, the boss Waza, is not ideal in higher settings on the load switches. So, yeah, uh, I would go definitely with his advice. He says it's safe but not entirely great. Um, hi, we tuned to see. Super chat, thank you very much. It's super 9, 79 Super Reverb has two... 200 microfarad has 20 okay it's got two 200 microfarads in series for the main oh um yeah it's safe to go from the two 220s to the two 100s if you want um probably be easier on your uh, 5u4g rectifier um i'm not sure uh why they made that change but yes yeah, so you can absolutely do 200 microfarads you can do 280 microfarads if you can find them if I had a two, uh, a 79 Super Reverb uh, came in and I had a choice, if I were ordering caps, I would order the 220s. But if I already had the 100s, I'd probably just go with the 100s. It's, it's totally safe. Jim Cox, yeah, I want to get a, D, a DB letter, uh, level meter for the stuff I do here, like you see on the pedal show. The trouble is the ones like they have on the pedal show, you have to have... You have to calibrate it, so to, I have to buy that dB meter and then buy another dB meter uh, that's calibrated so I can calibrate the one that displays, and um, you know, and then I have to get an app on my phone that verifies that the first one it really is. And so I, to get the $100 meter up on the wall, I need to spend about $300 to do that, and I just haven't yet. Uh, but pretty much anything that you're going to hear on my channel unless I say otherwise is, is recorded without a master volume unless it's like a 100 watt Marshall where I have to in which case you'll see it in the video I doubt you're going to hear unless it's a champ or something or maybe some Princeton stuff I don't think you're ever going to see any amp on the channel that's below 85 um, and I try not to go over or too much over 100, 110 here because it's a relatively small room um I imagine most of my stuff is 90 to 100. Uh, but I'm imagining that. I, I, if it hurts, I stop. Or I'll do it for very p short periods of time with headphones on. Uh, C12NA, yeah, Wes, if you've got the C12N, the, uh, either the Jupiter or the G12C would make you very happy. Thanks, Captain Sexy 90. And I, Is that a picture of Captain Kangaroo? Now I've got a picture of of how sexy he could be at, at age 90. That's scary. Thanks, Dave Bell. Um, yeah, I pass on the PRS uh, to channel H. Thanks, Van Halenite. All right, I think we're going to wind this down. Um, I don't know if next Saturday I'm going to be able to do this. I hope to. I enjoy this. It's uh, one of the highlights of my week. But I will go ahead and tell you that on November 7th, Saturday, at uh, noon my time, so 1 p.m. Eastern, 10, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific, we're going to have our second uh, edition of Technical Difficulties featuring our very own Dave Friedman. So you're going to have Dave Friedman here uh, with a microphone, and you can ask him all kinds of amp questions, and we can all admire his faux hawk. So anyway... Uh, that's going to be fun. That's going to be November 7th. We'll get all that posted. And if the date or time were to change between now and then, we will uh, certainly announce that. But I think Dave's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I've got more 
wonderful guests. That sounds so professional, doesn't it? I've got some more fantastic guests. I've got a lot of people in the industry, uh, musicians, guitarists, producers, uh, amp designers, people who run companies, and schlubs like me who just like to solder things all lined up. I think it's going to be a fun thing we're going to do about once a month. We start off with Brad. We're going to go to Dave, and then we'll see where the wind takes us. And to the rest of you guys, let's see where the wind takes us all this week. And I'm going to sign off now. Adieu, adieu to you and you, but not you.